Hello, and welcome back to Soteriology 101, where we believe that God loves all babies. Um, and Warren McGrew is with me. It feels like we have to say that. Sure, we have to say that um, anyway. Um, you know, the, this uh, bail gate has been going on back and forth, and some people may not know what that's all about. And if you don't, then you can go back and watch the last broadcast uh, where, where uh, uh, Jordan uh, joined us, and we kind of talked through all of that. Um, but I, I recently posted something on uh, not only on Twitter, but also on the YouTube page. And I wanted to present this because there were some people um, who doubted whether or not James White really taught this concept of infant damnation. Um, and so I, I wanted to kind of lay this out there and, and, and demonstrate for you what James White actually believes and has taught on this, this point. Um, and so if you'll look with me here and, and Warren, by the way, welcome to the broadcast. I appreciate you being here. Well, glad to be here. I feel like I'm home. Um, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll include Warren more into this after I lay the foundation here. And he's always, he knows he's always welcome to interrupt and jump in. That's the only way he gets a word in with me jabbing away is to jump in and, uh, and interrupt me. So he knows that he's got permission to do that anytime. But, um, I, I wrote this on, on Twitter. I said, if your theology requires the damnation of any infant, uh, elect or not, you know, in other words, if there is damnation of any infant who dies or an aborted baby or, uh, you know, uh, someone with a mental illness, all those things are included in that word infant. If, if your theology requires the damnation of any infant who dies in order to maintain consistency, then you have bad theology. And I, and I stand by that with, with as much vehement uh, dogmatism that I can muster. I, I mean, I, I, I think this is one hill I can plant a flag on pretty firmly without even hesitating, uh, even a bit. Um, and yes, I am aware that many, if not most mainstream Calvinists like John MacArthur, like John Piper, Phil Johnson recently posted a tweet in response to one of my tweets with his explanation of why he believes every infant will go to heaven. Every infant who dies will go to heaven. Um, th th it's a mainstream view of most Calvinists. Please hear me say that. Um, Warren knows that. Warren posted that long before the whole Bellgate came out. We we all we all understand. Most mainstream Calvinists believe that every single infant that dies will go to heaven. Everybody hear us say that. Okay, so we're not misrepresenting all Calvinists here. We are specifically targeting those consistent quote unquote. I say consistent Calvinists who are more consistent with Calvinism than they are the Bible in our opinion. But those Calvinists, like James White is today and I will prove this, who believe that infants are damned, not all infants, but the non-elect infants are damned, those are the people we are vehemently standing against. Vehemently. And we think it's inconceivable, and you'll like that word because it's a word that I stole from James White from 1987, we think it's inconceivable that anybody would believe that God damns to punishment or punishes any infant who dies. We, we think that's inconceivable. And I think everyone who's listening to this intuitively deep down in your conscience, the deepest part of who you are, what you know about Jesus, what you know about what God reveals through scripture also believes that it is absolutely inconceivable that God would punish an aborted baby, for example, um, that the first consciousness that he comes to is being punished for being what conceived. He just, he's just born into hell and he's just, con only conception he has is being punished for something he has absolutely no control over, has no con conception of what it's even about. He's just born into hell, I, I guess. I, it's Think about that. Let your mind just go there. Some people, this is where the cognitive dissonance steps in and they just step away from it and go, no, I don't want to talk about it. God didn't talk about it in the Bible. This is just never brought up in the Bible. What are you talking about not brought up in the Bible? Of course, the Bible addresses children. It addresses the, the innocent. Um, go listen to some of Warren's videos and on all the verses that are talking about children and uh, the, the kingdom of heaven is made up of such as these and the goodness of God and the gracious of the mercies are over all his creation. The, of course, the Bible talks about these things the, for people. Say, oh, the Bible doesn't talk about this stuff. It does. It absolutely does. Okay. Anyway, I'm already on my soapbox. I can't even get through my tweet. All right. Uh, any, anyway, here it goes. I said, I cannot see that. In other words, the view that some like Piper and MacArthur hold to. I cannot see how that is consistent with their Calvinism, considering all those who remain in unbelief as adults on Calvinism do so because of the condition they were born into, which is the T of Tulip, and thus have no more meaningful control over their decisions than does an infant. 
If you'd argue that God's grace would cover infants due to their inability to believe, why wouldn't you likewise argue that God's grace would cover anyone born unable to willingly believe due to factors beyond their control? In other words, the 25-year-old who's born a reprobate under Calvinism has no more or less control over his decisions than the aborted baby. He's just older. That, that's the only difference. He maybe is not as cute and cuddly as the little infant, but he is just as unable. He is just as, uh, he is being acted upon. He is not, he does not have any meaningful control over his decisions on either view. And so that, that's why I think it's inconceivable to think that a 25 year old would be damned for reasons beyond his control. Um, it, it, it what makes it inconceivable is what you're judging something for something that's not within their control. It's the same thing as I know, I know racism is a very touchy topic, but the reason racism is so repulsive to us is why? Because you're judging people for something they have no control over, the color of their skin. That's inconceivable for us, for somebody to say, I don't like you because of the color of your skin, or I don't like you because of your height or eye color or something that they can't control. You, you judge people not by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. Why? Because presumably they have some control over the content of their character. But according to the T of Tulip, they don't have any control ultimately of the content of their character because if they're reprobates, they are born God-haters who will always hate God and his law from the day they are born till the day they die. And they have absolutely no control over the content of their character any more so than they do the, con uh, the, the color of their skin. And so it becomes equally incomprehensible as to why God would damn them if they have absolutely no moral, moral, meaningful control over their choices, then does an infant. That's why I think Piper's view, MacArthur's view, though it's closer aligns with the character of God and scripture, it still does not align with Calvinism's view of anthropology. And even White makes that case, by the way, um, which we'll hear in just a minute. The spirit, the spirit in a Calvinist like Piper or MacArthur who defends salvation of all infants is the same spirit that rejects Calvinistic reprobation altogether. It's the gateway drug to provisionism. In other words, when you begin to realize why Calvinists like Piper and MacArthur and others argue for infant salvation of all infants who die being saved, that is the gateway drug to provisionism because you begin to recognize the reason they're arguing for the universal salvation of all infants who die is the exact same reason we argue for God's provision for all uh, that he's created because he's gracious, he's good, and he's, he is, he is demonstrably good. And therefore we're arguing that God saves people and provides salvation because of his goodness. That's our starting point is his love. That's that our starting point is not God's meticulous divine control over every molecule. Our starting point is the love of God. Why? Because the climactic event in all of human history is the cross, his sacrifice of himself for his enemies. It, it, the, the climactic view of all of history is not quote unquote, this divine sovereign decree that God says, Hey, I'm going to now control everybody. There, there's nothing in the scripture that even remotely suggests that's what God's doing. So why would we focus on that? Why, why not focus on the climactic event in all of human history? The cross, God's sacrifice for that which he loves, for those he loves, all of humanity, for the world. Um, I also uh, kind of followed up with that and same, same basic um, uh, tweet. It says, if you believe God would be gracious to infants who die without the capacity to accept the gospel appeal, even though they are guilty and deserve hell, why do you believe God would be any less gracious to a 25 year old who dies without the capacity to accept the gospel appeal? If they are both really equally guilty and both equally incapable of a positive response, what makes you think God would be more gracious to one over the other? In other words, what makes you think Calvinist God would be more gracious to the cute little two year old than he would the 25 year old if they are both equally incapable by divine decree to believe the truth being laid out in front of them? This is why I say that infant salvation, universal infant salvation is the gateway drug to provisionism. Because once you start seeing this, you'll begin to realize maybe I'm more of a provisionist than I, th than I thought when I really begin to, to lay out these doctrines in all, for all practical purposes. What's their age or their inability have to do with it on Calvinism, given their innate inability of all to believe the gospel? And then lastly, 
I also, and I, I promise Warren will get a chance to jump in here. I'm, I told, I, I warned him when I divide, divided him on that I was going to lay the groundwork before we jumped into a lot of discussion over Bellgate and all that kind of stuff. But here, here I write this, dear Calvinists, and I do want to get your thought on this, um, Warren, dear Calvinists, if someone argued that God physically restrained most people from coming to him, even though they wanted to come, and you argued against that view because you don't believe that's what the Bible teaches. And they rebut by saying, who are you to question God? How would you reply? Now, it, I, I should have predicted that people on Twitter, some of them wouldn't follow this because they immediately accused me of misrepresenting Calvinists and they say that we don't believe that people are trying to be saved and can't. I said, I know that. That's, that's the very point that I'm saying. What if you run into somebody who does believe that God is literally physically restraining, keeping people from mentally understanding, physically coming, even though they want to, they really want to believe, they really want to be uh, saved, they really want to follow God, but he's just keeping them from doing something they really want to do. Deep down, they have a desire to do it. What would you say to them if they argued that? And, and you tried to rebut that by saying, no, that's not what the Bible teaches. It's actually true that um, people don't want to come, not that they can't, um, come, but that they don't want to, they don't have any desire to come. And you would try to explain that to them. And then they, then, and the, their rebuke bu to you, the way they answer your arguments is to say, who are you to question God? If God wants to physically restrain people from, who want to come from coming, then who are you to question him? And the reason I'm doing that to you, Calvinist is to help you see things from a different vantage point. I want you to see what it feels like when, when we get rebutted with that same old repeated argument again and again and again we are trying to rebut what you're saying but instead of engaging that rebuttal you quote at us romans 9 out of context in our estimation and you don't even seem to know what our interpretation of romans 9 is and you say who are you to question god and the reason i'm asking this question is to put your yourself in our shoes put you in our shoes by saying how would you answer a person who is trying to say that God is literally physically restraining people who want to come from coming. And, and when the, you try to rebut them, they just yell back at you. Who are you to question God? God can physically restrain you, but he wants to physically restrain. Who do you say God doesn't do, do that? Wouldn't you want them to stop assuming that your disagreement with them is equal to questioning God? Wouldn't you try to show them from scripture that God doesn't keep men from coming who want to come? Wouldn't you want to help them understand your view of moral inability and defend against their teaching that God is literally holding people back from coming who really wish they could. Well, of course you would, Calvinist. Now, hopefully that may help you better understand where we are coming from when we question your doctrine of total inability and irresistible grace. We are not questioning God. We are trying to show you in Scripture why we believe those doctrines are in error. So when you quote Romans 9 at us without a clear understanding of how we understand that chapter, you're not helping further the conversation. Understanding that Romans 9 entails the judicial hardening of Israel, a people who had freely grown calloused in their rebellion and could have done otherwise, is a significant point of distinction between Calvinism's assumption that Israel was just born like that, quote unquote, inability, the T, um, due to the fall and couldn't have willed to do otherwise because they were not chosen and irresistibly graced. Now, you may disagree, but at least further the conversation by engaging with our actual point of contention instead of just yelling us down by quoting Romans 9 at us ad, ad nauseum. And so the reason I point that out is because that first sentence right there, that first paragraph right there illustrates the, the issue that I'm bringing up is that you could pretty much say God does X. God does, you can, you can fill in the blank, whatever X is, and you can make that any heinous thing that you could possibly fathom, some inconceivable thing that you could fathom, um, something like, you know, physically restraining people from coming whenever they want to, something like that, or, you know, all kinds of, all the bad words that'll get you demonetized, okay? All the, the worst possible evil things. And somebody comes along and says, God does X. And you fill in the blank whatever X is. And you, you let your imagination roll as to all those things that X can be referring to. If anybody says one of those heinous things about God and their defense for whatever that heinous thing is, is basically, who are you to question him? Because he can do X if he wants to do X. Then where's the line? 
there is no line anymore. This is why C.S. Lewis said, if his black is our white, and our white is his black, then we can say we worship we know not what. If his good is our bad and our bad is his good, then we could worship an all-powerful, we'd be worshiping an all-powerful demon. And you turn Christianity in a form of devil worship is basically what C.S. Lewis argues. Because if you ultimately adopt this, this view that, that because God does it, it must be therefore good, and therefore, and right, and therefore you can't question it. So anybody can say any heinous thing about God that they want to say, and then basically baptize it with the phrase, who are you to question God if he wants to do X, whatever that thing is? Who are you to question him? Well, I tell you who I am to question him. I'm a Bible reader. I'm a person that reads the scripture. And this tells me this is something God doesn't do. And this explains to me who God is and his love and the attributes of love. And God is love. And here's the attributes of love. And so I'm here to tell you God doesn't do X. Why? Because the Bible says so. The Bible shows us who God is and his law. And his law reveals his character and his precepts and his the principles of what's good and right and wrong. I'm a, I'm a man with a conscience that God's given me. Intuitively, I know it's wrong to punish a baby by spanking them on the... Get, get a, a two-month-old baby and who's crying and you start spanking them as hard as you can on the rear and telling them to stop. Every everybody in the world would know intuitively. You don't do that. That's abusive. Why? Because you they can't control who they are and what they are doing. They have no control over this at that age. We know we don't do that. There are some intuitive things we know are right and wrong based upon not only the scriptures, but based upon the God-given conscience, the intuition which is in us, which cries out, that's inconceivable that you would believe that God punishes infants. And again, the reason I use that word is because that is the word that James White used in his article back in 1987. He's asked the question about infants and mentally incompetence and their salvation. And he says, since they have made no conscious decision, speaking of infants, against God, it is inconceivable that they undergo any kind of punishment. Rather, it is clear that they are ushered into the presence of the Lord. Yurik Zwingli felt that all who died in infancy or who were mentally incompetent were of the elect of God. And I feel comfortable with that idea. Of course, anyone who asks the question is neither an infant or mentally handicapped. And he even goes on to argue even stronger. He says, Mackenzie is making up his own ideas as he goes along on this one. Since he has created a position that is not biblical. Am, notice what he says, am I not justified? Am I not just as safe to say the sacrifice of Christ is sufficient for all infants and mentally incompetence? I could say that if I wished, if someone simply would allow for babies to be innocent, i.e. have a sin nature while not being guilty of individual sin. Dr. White was much more reasonable in 1987 because he recognized what was inconceivable. The conscience that God gave him, a regenerate man, to see infant damnation as inconceivable is something that I think is a starting point. I think he would shout his old self down as a Pelagian heretic now, because that's what he does to those of us who question his reading of uh, Romans chapter five and don't insist that babies are guilty for their individual sin. But instead, as Eric Zwingli argues, they don't inherit guilt. Remember, Luther called Zwingli a Pelagian because of his view of inherited guilt, by the way. So you're not going to get away from that label, whether you're in the reformed camp or not, just so you know, it's a boogeyman label that's existed for a long time. Now, with all that said, I want you to listen to Dr. White's current position on this. What does he currently believe about this? And I don't know how better to represent James White than let him speak for himself. Now, I've clipped this just to cut out some of the ramblings and you know, just to make it you know, bite size. But the link is in the show notes. You can go watch the whole thing. I'm not trying to hide anything that James White says. I'm not trying to, to ignore James White's real views or misrepresent him. I want you to understand Calvinism. I really do. Because I think the more you understand about Calvinism and all of its implications, the more you're going to love provisionism and you're going to recognize Christ as being a provisionist. Because those of you who have the Spirit of God residing in you, I think deep down your conscience and the Spirit of God is going to guide you to truth if you understand with eyes wide open what both sides are actually saying on their view. All right, let's watch. I have a question. I was reading The Death of Death and The Death of Christ by John Owen, and towards the end of the book, he um, 
cites John 3.3, 3, where Jesus says, you know, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And he uses that as an argument against the idea that unborn children automatically go to heaven if they die. Okay, so I, I want you to make sure you understand this. John Owen, the man who believes, it really was famous for promoting limited atonement, by the way, uh, against the Prince of Theologians and many of the others who believed in more of an unlimited atonement. Um, he's arguing for infant damnation. So a lot of you quote from John Owen, you respect John Owen. He's arguing for infant damnation. And he actually uses John 3.3, 3, according to this caller, at least. I haven't checked up on this, but according to this caller, John Owen argues for infant damnation. And that's what this guy is asking about. Warren, did you want to jump in on that? Not yet. No, I, I, want, to hear, uh, I want to hear White's response. All right, let's, let's move along. Like in a miscarriage or an abortion or death in the womb or something like that. And I'm, I'm just wondering how would you respond to that kind of argument? Because I know like, Todd Friel and John MacArthur believe that unborn children who die in the womb do in fact go straight to heaven. Yeah, you know, it's a very common question. It's, it's, uh, there are a couple of passages that I think the, the tendency is to build way too much upon them, um, mm. especially uh, David and talking about the infant who died, uh, a few things like that, that were very unusual instances of divine judgment for human sin in a very, very particular context. And extrapolating that out to all infants in all situations, I think is, is a bit too much, but. Okay. So just so you know, he, he went over, um, you know, John MacArthur's view of uh, Todd Friel's view, uh, Justin Peters, he mentions Justin Peters also holds that view. Um, Phil Johnson holds that view. And he mentions those guys and he says, I think they're going too far to say all infants that die, go to heaven. He's saying they're, they're putting too much on those passages like David's baby. Um, and he says that he think he thinks they're going too far with it. Okay. Now I, I didn't put all of that in there just for the sake of time. Uh, if you're familiar with the London Baptist Confession, it utilizes the terminology of elect infants. And so uh, what I start with is I, I start with the presumption uh, that God is just as free in this area uh, as he is in the salvation of adult human beings or older human beings. That is, uh, that it's a matter of God's grace. Okay, so what I hear him saying there, and, and Warren, tell me if this is not being fair, is that in the same way that he unilaterally or unconditionally chooses to save some adults and not others, in the same way he's unilaterally choosing to save some infants and not others. Yeah, I mean, right? he's, he's beginning with that, the Calvinist paradigm, those, those presuppositions, and he's going well to be consistent and, and, and consistent with my view of God's freedom and election and all of this, then I have to affirm that God is just as free to send infants to eternal torment as he is a 25 or an 85 year old, because all of that was determined in eternity past before the children being born had done anything good or right, you know, or evil. So I have to affirm this logical entailment and implication and follow it where it goes. And that is that God can damn infants as much as he can adults because age has nothing to do with it. Yeah, because if it's unconditional, it can't be conditioned upon their age. Okay. And so if they haven't reached an age of accountability and therefore that's the that's the condition of them being elect, then it would undermine their uh, concept of unconditional election. Yeah. And so this is, again, I think White is more consistent with the claims of Calvinism than is Phil Johnson and MacArthur and all the others listed. But at the same time, it's so inconceivable that a person would defend this position, which is the reason I think White reacts the way that he does to you, which we'll get into in a little bit later. But I want you to hear the rest of this because I want you to hear it clearly stated from the horse's mouth, so to speak. I'm not calling him a horse, but you hear what I'm saying. From, from White himself, him explaining his view of infant damnation. You cannot make it an automatic thing and just simply go, oh, well, you know, ticket punched, uh, gone to heaven. It's this, God has just as much freedom to extend his mercy and grace in that context as he does in any other. So, Which you have to have the entailment of that. What's the other side of that? 
He has every much right to reprobate an infant if he wants to. And who are you to question God if he reprobates an infant? That's implicit in what he just said, just, just being clear. Yeah. And, and he actually says it when he quotes from Augustine in the second part of the clip. So hear it out. Do I, 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 so on the one side, you have people who say, oh, sorry, no faith, automatic, automatic hell for you. And then the people on the other side don't need it, automatic heaven for you. And I'm in the middle going, I think God's probably consistent here, and uh, he's going to have elect infants, and then there are others who will not be. And I don't know what basis to put that on other than the same basis of all the rest of us uh, as a demonstration of his glorious grace. We so as a demonstration of his glorious grace, God, God damns some infants, and he yep. saves others. That, that's what I heard. What Am happens? I, I'm not when, not being fair. According to Calvinism, where do the the non-elect go? That that's where no. these babies. No. That's where these babies are going to go. It doesn't matter right. if you're gu- plus because if they're guilty, yeah. then what is the what is the just punishment for the guilty? That's it. Hell. Yeah. And so if they're not elect, if they're not saved, go to heaven. Then the other other place is hell. That's it. Now. At least Chris Date or other annihilationists wouldn't have that problem. They could just say, I guess, that the baby doesn't live for eternity or they're just annihilated, um, which, again, is not near as troubling as the concept of being punished, but just not ever existing or something of that nature. But then that re- creates all kinds of other issues with regard to the soul and the eternality of the soul and things like that well, as far as also where, latent, where the Calvinist goes. Also, it depends on, on how you understand uh, annihilationism. So most most annihilationists or, or conditional security uh, or conditional immortality guys would say that there's a resurrection of the dead, even the the wicked and unrighteous, and then they're judged and and, and destroyed. So this baby that died in the womb or through some violent means or natural means or a young child is resurrected to see God and all of its family and people around, and then cast into something that would destroy that soul. And there's still punishment in the conditionalism, uh, the view. There's there's still that punishment there. It's just not eternal torment, but it's an eternal punishment. That's a point that that men like uh, Chris Date have, have made. Is it, it is an eternal punishment. So that baby is going away to eternal punishment. So it's coming to consciousness out of that death. It's not just dying physically and then lingering there, but it's actually being resurrected and then destroyed by God. So it it doesn't it doesn't have the same eternal uh, uh, aspect of it, but it's still God destroying uh, an, an infant. And it, it's something that the adherent of infant damnation and conditional immortality needs to be prepared to give an address for. Why do I believe that the resurrection will see God? I'm going to use some polemical language here because I think it's disgusting and I think I'm entitled to do that. Why do you believe God's chucking babies into an all-consuming fire that will destroy them, that they'll They'll perish and cease to exist. What is it about that child that deserves destruction? And what is it about the God revealed in Scripture that indicates that He's going to do that? Yeah, well, well said. All right. Um, here, here, here's where he gets even more specific by reading from Augustine, because Augustine doesn't beat around the bush when it comes to uh, condemnation or damnation of of infants. Here, and he he obviously agrees with Augustine as he's quoting from him. Say one infant enters in the kingdom of God by grace because God is good. Another infant deservedly does not enter because God is just. There is no question of fate in either case because God does what He wishes. But although we know, can you get any more clear than that right there? One infant enters in the kingdom by grace. Another deservedly does not. In other words, where else do they go? Hell, okay? That's damnation to demonstrate God's justice, okay? He demonstrates his love by saving one infant. He demonstrates his justice by damning another. That's just, that that it's in black and white right there in front of you. He just read it, and now he's about to affirm it, okay? That one is condemned according to the judgment, and another is delivered according to the mercy of him whose mercy and judgment we praise with confidence. Who are we to ask God why he condemns the one instead of the other? Shall the object molded say to him who molded it, Why hast thou made me thus? Is not the potter master of his clay to make from the same mass of vitiated and condemned origin one vessel for honorable use according to mercy, another for dishonorable use according to judgment? So Augustine, like White and many other Calvinists, since uh, Augustine introduced these deterministic 
philosophy into the church are reading Romans 9 to, to, to ultimately support infant damnation, reprobation, um, and the concept that God, before Jacob and Esau were born, babies, before they were ever born, God decided to reprobate one of them, uh, send one of them to hell, and to save the other. Now, even some Calvinists don't take it that far these days, as we've already said. That's not where, the way all Calvinists read Romans 9. But Augustine's being very consistent here on that point, to say one baby is reprobated, the other baby is, is saved. Um, and who are you to question God if he wants to make one baby into a reprobate and one baby into an elect person? It's basically the way they're taking that. Now you're saying, okay, well, that seems like that's what it says there in Romans 9. You read the plain reading of the text. That's what it says. Well, keep, it, it, again, if you understand our view, what we believe he's talking about is the fact that um, two nations are in their womb. The concept of one nation becoming hardened and calloused and then fighting against Israel as the Edomites did, coming under his wrath. Um, and therefore, even children of Abraham who stand against the promises of God and the people of God, like the Israelites of that day were doing by standing against Paul and the other apostles, that they will face judgment. They will be under the wrath of God. They, they, I will curse those who curse you, and I will bless those who bless you, is the original promise. And I, am, uh, I will bless all the nations through your seed, is the original promise, which is exactly what he's fulfilling. And therefore, a nation, when it becomes hardened and calloused, God can take that nation, just like Jeremiah 18 says, and take that spoiled lump that's spoiled in his hands. He didn't spoil it. They have rebelled and become spoiled. And he can reshape and remold that lump into a ignoble vessel to cry out, crucify him, give us, uh, give us Barabbas, crucify Jesus, doing an ignoble thing for a good purpose. And who are you to question God if he takes that spoiled lump of Israel and makes it that ignoble, uh, that uh, spoiled lump into an ignoble vessel to bring about redemption for the world? And who are you to talk back to God who does that? That's the point we think Paul is getting to. In other words, the the objector is not objecting against reprobation of infants. The, the objector is a Jew, just like in Romans 3, objecting to being uh, hardened and sh shaped and molded into one who doesn't even believe and follow the Messiah and believe and follow God, but instead crucifies his own Messiah. That's the objector in the mind of Paul, in our view. So that, that's the two views side by side. Which is more reasonable? Okay, Which one doesn't paint God as monstrous, as throwing infants into hell? Um, which, which one is consistent with the view of Paul who cries out that he would give his life for these hardened Jews? Which one is consistent with him holding out his hands all day long to them as he goes on to say in the very next chapter? Which one is consistent with these ones who have stumbled, but not stumbling beyond recovery? Which one is consistent with the fact that, yes, they've been cut off, but they can be grafted back in if they would leave their unbelief? Holding out hope that his ministry to the Gentiles will provoke his fellow countrymen to envy so that they will see the error of their ways and turn so as to live and, and be grafted back in. Which, which one is more consistent with the reading of the whole counsel of God's word and the, the, the one who's willing to lay down his life for his enemies? and stop on the side of the road and help like the Good Samaritan, which is more consistent, brothers and sisters. And when you ask yourself that question, you have to ask yourself, what does my intuition and the conscience, God-given conscience within me, screaming out to me saying when somebody tries to tell me that God damns infants? The fact that we're even having to have this discussion with brothers is inconceivable when you really begin to think about it. It's absolutely inconceivable. And that's one of the reasons... I will say this, Warren, I know what you said was provocative. I know it was somewhat inflammatory, especially the way it was taken. But I think it's a gift from God when such things are brought out so clearly that the Calvinist is face to face with the consistency and the implications of their doctrines, that they have to actually grapple with it beyond the normal cognitive distance that they allow themselves to go, where they just don't allow themselves to think about the implications of their worldview and recognize that they're following those who are following men like White anyway, are following people who actually promote infant damnation and realize, am I really doing that? Am I really willing to go that far to, to just say this inconceivable thing about the God that I love and believe and worship every Sunday and throughout my day and serve every day? Am I willing to say this about my God? Really? I want that just to itch at you. I want that to be a burr in your saddle, as we in Texas say. I want that just to be something that absolutely keeps you up at night. And I want you to grieve over that view of God because it is a false view of our God. And I think that has to be very, very clear. And people need to begin to stand up against 
that kind of false theology and false doctrine within our church. And I think Dr. White needs to be held account for teaching this kind of thing. Let, let me finish the clip, and then I want you to jump in on this, Warren. Yeah. He does not make both for honorable use, lest the nature think itself to have merited honor as if guiltless. He does not make both for dishonorable use, that mercy may triumph over judgment. Therefore, the condemned has no right to complain about his punishment, nor can the one gratuitously delivered glory proudly over his merit. Instead, he humbly gives thanks when he recognizes in the one required to pay the debt what under the same circumstances was bestowed upon himself. Now that, again, is pretty much what our discussion has been over and over and over again. Um, and not only is it you know, straight out of Romans chapter 9. Okay, so notice he straight out of Romans chapter 9. So he's agreeing exactly with what he just read from Augustine. That's, that, that basically... One infant enters the kingdom of God by grace because God is good. Another infant deservedly does not enter because God is just. And the condemned have no right to complain about their judgment. And he's saying that's exactly what he's been arguing with regard to Romans 9. So all of you who commented under my post on YouTube saying, where are you getting this from White? I, he don't, I don't think he's saying that. Um, I, I want you to ask yourself now, now that you know that's exactly what he did say, are you still willing to question him? Because all of you, when you didn't think that's really what he was saying, when you thought I was misrepresenting him, you, you were willing to be outraged that I would say such a thing about James White. But now that you know he actually argues for infant damnation, what are you willing to do about it? That, that's the big question. All right, Warren, go ahead. I mean, goodness, that's a lot to follow. <laughs> You know, no, I mean, goodness, how do I, how do I follow that? You just set the piano on fire. I'm not going out on that stage, you know, <laughs> <clears throat> I don't know. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm right, you, I guess, on that well, someone's saying you, you, on Sam Carter saying you, you dump him, you know, you know, you, you dump the date, you know, when the date starts talking about infant damnation, you dump the date. Um, you, you hold the man accountable for his beliefs. You say, how dare you believe that? How dare you promote that? What, what does that do as an apologist? You're giving every atheist out there the excuse that they're looking for to dump God and to walk away from Christian faith by promoting this concept and idea of infant damnation. Um, it, yes, it is. It is absolutely preposterous. And of course, White um, responded to um, one of the tweets that was put up. And he says, I, uh, well, well, you, oh, you had posted something, um, the, the, the Calvinist view of infants that you had gone through your video mm -hmm. and, uh, and Cheryl had, had posted that. And so he responds to it and he says, I had to look at some blocked accounts to see this and had to chuckle. The guy got caught demonstrating he has no integrity or honesty. I guess he's talking about your, uh, your original yes. clip. Yes. His comments about reformed folks and their children were absurd and childish and reprehensible. And we already talked about that in our last episode that he obviously misunderstood the point you were making. And we've already kind of discussed that. Well, and I think he, he um, saw my video yeah. here. So he knows, even if he misunderstood the first video, he's commenting on a video, I think, where I made that abundantly clear that this is not unanimous among all reformed or all Calvinist. It's a strain that you find in various Augustinian traditions, including Calvinists. Um, so it's not unanimous. So he knew that commenting here without question, because he just, he's commenting on a video where I made that clear. So, yeah. All right. And so, and of course my, my willingness to allow it was likewise reprehensible. Well, if I understood him as saying every Calvinist, um, believes in infant damnation, and I understood him to be, say that every, therefore every Calvinist is, uh, like a pagan bell worshiper, the way you took it, then I probably would have cut in and stepped in and said something, but that's not the way I took him. I took it for what he was actually saying in the context of our discussion. Um, and so, and now after comparing us to Molech worshipers, uh, he wants to debate infant damnation, whatever on earth that's supposed to mean. And so I'm, I'm not sure why he makes that particular statement and you kind of made, you know, a, a, satirical joke about that yeah. um yeah. in your, kind of an apology video and i saw that and sometimes s s satirizing things like the babylon b does is it gets to a point of using satire to to make a point to say um basically surely you know what infant damnation is i mean we just played two clips of you defending infant damnation the damnation of non-elect infants 
And so while you're acting as if you don't know what, what the doctrine of infant damnation is or the view of infant damnation is, um, it seems to be just a dodge or a red herring of some sort to keep from having to deal with a difficult doctrine on your view. Um, and at least that's that's the way I took it. Yeah, that's, and, definitely uh, how go, I, go ahead. that's definitely how I took it. That's why I did my uh, formal apology to Dr. James White because, you know, he, he obviously, I mean, if, if we were to take his statement here, on face value, he doesn't even know what infant damnation is, which is laughable because he wrote an article defending, uh, you know, salvation for babies and then later starts teaching against that. So obviously he knew, obviously he was being intentionally obtuse or dismissive <clears throat> so that he didn't have to engage the the criticism. And so that's why I did the, uh, the satirical apology, just noting like, dude, you knew what this was. Just own it and give a biblical defense, live or die by that defense and be willing to change your mind when you're shown to be wrong. Like just own it. You know, like uh, still to this day, like James, let's debate infant damnation. You can say, I believe only elect babies go to heaven. Conversely, all non-elect babies go to torment. You can phrase that proposition however you want to make it as palatable with your system. And we can debate the idea of if infant damnation is biblical. Be happy to do that. I would include in there a challenge for total depravity because I see these as being linked. But you know, he, he would rather say, "Well, I don't know what that means." You know, what does that mean? It's like you know what that means. Like you've you've been you've been teaching on it. You attacked me. Like, come on, let's 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 man up, and you can show the whole world what a big old Pelagian heretic Warren McGrew is by thinking God saves babies, all babies. What a horrible thing. I need. Get the green wood and matches, ladies and gentlemen. Let's let's string him up. What a heretical thing to say that God would save all babies. And in the meantime, you can defend the righteous, godly strain of Calvinism view that God chucks unbelieving babies, unelect babies, into torment. You can do, you can do that. Own own your position. Some positions in Christianity, right? I think we would both concede some Christian positions are difficult to defend. That doesn't mean they're not true. So yes. James, this could be one of those positions. This could be one of those really difficult positions that for some reason is true. And, and Leighton and I and the majority of Christians just don't understand it. And here's your chance to come in, champion the cause for why you believe biblically God chucks non-elect babies into torment. This could be one of those instances. Now, I see numerous instances in scripture and and the, the character of God as to why I can't affirm this. I see it within the writings of the, the early church, uh, you know, non-Augustinian traditions and, and contra-Augustinian uh, anthropology. I, I see good reason to, to think that you're sincerely, profoundly, and horrendously mistaken. But not only is this just in the realm of intellectual theology and it's an idea where Warren and Leighton disagree with James White over. It's not just an idea. This has practical implications because you're telling mm -hmm. people who are grieving the loss of a child that God decreed from all eternity that baby perish so that well, then he could possibly, turn around and potentially. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, it died yeah. early. He decreed that because they're, they're theistic. Oh, 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 yeah. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. First, yeah. God decreed that that child would perish mortally. And then there's a strong chance that he decreed that baby perish uh, eternally. And so this there's there's parents that are grieving, you know, and if if you're coming in there and you're telling them that this is the God that they need to serve and worship, then you need to give a defense for why that's the case. Don't just say, who are you to question God for possibly throwing your child into torment? You need to give a biblical argument and a case for why you believe that's true, not just appeal to some confession of the Reformed or Augustine or some statement or you know, I'm trying to be logical with my interpretation of Romans. Like, cool, then defend that. Defend that. Yeah. But to turn around and, and 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 attack us and say, how dare you bring this up? You're not giving this the respect it deserves. You're trying to run from it. We're bringing the respect it deserves by calling you out. And you're running. You're biking. You're, you're motorcycling. You're driving the car. You're jumping in the plane. You're out of here. We're bringing the mm -hmm. respect it deserves. We're passionate well, and about I don't, it. And I don't know how. Misrepresentation yeah, of God's I, character. I, I don't know how to 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 represent White any. I mean, reading directly from his words, I'm putting it on the screen. Um, 
I, I don't know how to let him represent himself anymore. And you're, and I, he, he knows I've sent him emails saying he has a standing invitation to come onto the program and to discuss these things anytime he wants to. So he already knows that you're challenging him to do it on a live stage debate. Who's taking this seriously? I mean, who's, who's willing to, to allow you to represent yourself and talk through these things. Um, obviously we are, um, now, now this is one of the reasons that I've always asked, why is it when white debates, he debates on the Calvinistic talking points, i.e. the Calvinistic proof texts like Romans nine or John six, uh, or Ephesians one, but you don't, at least as far as I know, I've never seen him debate on second Peter three, nine or Ezekiel 18, 30 and following, or, uh, you know, first Timothy two, four, I, 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 he's given explanations of what he believes about those proof texts, but I've never seen him actually go toe to toe with someone in a debate on those topics. He tends to pick topics that he has an upper hand in. Um, and, and so that's maybe one of the reasons that uh, he's, he's been as successful as he has been in debates is because he, he chooses very carefully his willingness to go against, uh, you know, views that stand against him to, to, uh, too easy for him. Um, Chris Harris, one of our side chat commenters uh, from the Calvinistic vantage point, there is no doctrine of infant damnation. The word doctrine means teaching. Are you telling me there is no teachings from Calvinists about infant damnation? White just quoted Augustine giving a doctrine of infant damnation. Um, he read from the London Baptist Confession saying, the elect infants, which implicitly suggests there are not elect infants, right? Is that not a doctrine? Of course it is. It's a teaching. And so this is, again, another way in which Calvinists try to dodge the issue to say, oh, this just doesn't exist. This is just not there. There's nothing to see here. There's nothing to see here. And I see a lot of that on Twitter where people are saying, well, I'm just not willing to take a stance on this because the Bible just doesn't talk about it. And that's where I have to call out no, that, 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 that doesn't fly here. I'm sorry. Um, there's way too much in scripture that addresses the character of God, the goodness of God that addresses children. Um, uh, there, there's too many verses that we, I know you've read on your broadcast that I've presented in my article. There's an article of there at Sociology 101 called the age of accountability. If you typed in age, just the word age in the search feature, it'll come up the very first one walks through several passages of scripture where it talks about uh, people of certain age not having knowledge of good and evil and and uh you know not you know obviously not punishing them those kinds of things because of that uh, very issue um uh, the, the 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 fact that we we are we are asked to give an account for of ourselves to God and there's no infant that can give account to himself to God because he's an infant for goodness sake it's just this is intuitive this is not. This is one of those issues where some doctrines or some things don't need to be defended. They just need to be clearly stated so that people will see them for what they are. And the doctrine or the teaching of Calvinists about infant, infants being damned is one of those kinds of doctrines. I, I really don't have to defend against that doctrine. I just have to make sure people understand it so that you know intuitively if you're if you're not already a Kool-Aid drinking five point high Calvinist that's already adopted this way of thinking about God that no matter what anybody says bad about God you're just going to swallow it and say yeah that must be true as inconceivable as it may seem because my leader says so because you've surrendered over your sense making to your uh, Calvinistic leaders and you've adopted some inconceivable views about who God is and what he does based upon those things then uh, if you're not already in that boat, then you're probably still in a place where you're reasonable. The, the guys like Todd Friel and, and Piper um, and, and MacArthur and others who argue for infant salvation, all universally infant salvation, not just the elect ones like White argues for, those people I think are more likely, in my estimation, to see where we're coming from because they have not totally surrendered their sense making over just to adopt whatever inconceivable thing people say about God. That's why I call it the gateway drug to provisionism because once you understand the motivation for why a Calvinist would argue for universal infant salvation, you begin to understand the spirit behind provisionism because you understand the goodness and the grace of a God who would not damn the innocent, people who have no meaningful control over their decisions and their choices. 
And that's why I think this is very important topic because it really gets to the heart of the issue. Um, and, and I don't know how to be more, uh, any more clear about that. Um, now I have another video queued up here mm -hmm. that, um, that we can go through Warren, but I wanted to give you a chance to address any more that you wanted to address with regard to what white has said or, um, any of the other points that we brought up before we jump into that. No, I mean, I, I love that you brought up how this is a surrendering of your sense making. And I've noted this and elsewhere, infant damnation stems from the teaching of total depravity, which I believe is, is a form of gaslighting and, and spiritual abuse, the teaching of total depravity, because it says you can't rightly understand spiritual things. And it, it, it actually is, it's a form of gaslighting and it, it conditions you to accept these doctrines. And so then you encounter the next step. God throws some babies into eternal torment or destroys them. Well, you've already surrendered your sense making. So now you're going to appeal to mystery and you're going to say, well, God is just, isn't he free to do that? God is powerful and able to do a lot of things, but is the character and heart and self-revelation of God in scripture about what he wants and the way he sees children, is that in keeping with what you're claiming? And it's not. So they'll see all this teaching. They'll feel the innate thumbprint of God on their conscience. They'll experience the cognitive dissonance from their sense-making when they encounter this because they're affirming it, but they know better. And then you get this tension. I'm, I, mean, I know I'm speaking firsthand, right? When I tell you I've experienced every flavor of Calvinism, I adhered to this doctrine. People are going, you're misrepresenting Calvinists. Oh, really? So I misrepresented a Calvinist when I was a Calvinist. When I'm... I'm 21 years old. I'm in Deep Ellum, Dallas, standing out in front of The Door, which is a, a, a live Christian music venue in uh, like around 98, I think it was. And I remember talking to a, a lead singer of one of the bands, and I was defending Infant Damnation. And he said, well, I don't think I could serve a God like that. And I remember arguing with this guy and saying, then you don't even know God. I was defending this doctrine. And that man walked away from the faith. And that's a, that's a thing that I carry with me at 47 years of age now to my eternal shame and regret that I played a role in, in, in this man turning away because he saw the God I was representing and, and rejected it. And I, that's something I carry with me. I defended infant damnation. I taught this. Now, your form of Calvinism may not, right? But you were an inconsistent Calvinist. I was a consistent one. And you may say, well, you were hyper or you were high. Cool. I was high on, on, on surrendering my sense-making. I was high on my piety. I was high on this religious spirit where I was appealing to guys with longer beards than me that were more respected. I was high on something, but I wasn't high on the fruit of the spirit. I wasn't high on the words and, and truth of God. And, and I was causing harm to those that wouldn't perhaps otherwise have come to him. Now, you know... Yeah. I, I know what this is like. It doesn't mean that every Calvinist affirms total depravity. I remember arguing with Calvinists, trying to convince them to accept it. You know, um, mm -hmm. I remember being a, a father, a new a new father, and hearing my children cry, and and remembering the teaching. When they cry, they're lying. They're manipulating you. It's that total depravity. They're trying to bend you to their will, and you need to break them. Because if you don't, you're going to have problems with them when they're older. Like, I know what it's like to be a parent and operate with this in my mind. Now, fortunately, I was delivered from that when my children were young. But I mean, if you got another 10 hours, I can tell you about how I failed as a parent by trying to implement some of these doctrines. It doesn't mean I didn't love my kids. I did. But I was trying to be consistent with my doctrine and incorporate this into my worldview. And I mean, I, I got, a, I got a, a text from my daughter today. A little, a little video, you know, it's like, dad, I love you. Thanks for teaching me. Like, and, and I'm, I'm so delighted to get that. But with that is the sorrow that every parent that's ever fa failed their children to one degree or another, which is all of us, that sorrow is accompanying that sweetness. And, and as I'm getting that text today, I'm remembering how I viewed her as a totally depraved little baby. And it nearly broke me, Layton. Like that's, I want to spare people from this. God is so much better than they realize. And it's not a matter of, well, we just don't know. You're wrong. You do. 
And, and, and you don't want to take a tough stand and look at this because you're scared or you're lazy. Take a stand. Go get your Bible. Do the study. Look through the church history and take a stand. God does not want us to be cold or hot. I mean, excuse me, he doesn't want us to be lukewarm. He wants us to be cold or hot. Don't be a lukewarm person on this issue. This is significant. Take a stand. Don't be lukewarm. And well, um, this is the, the, what you're saying there is kind of one of the reasons that I, you know, with my book, um, God's Provision for All, is that I, I talk about how God is demonstrably good, meaning that the reason we call someone good in our world, you know, is is why what, what are what are what are qualities that would 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 deem us saying that hey Warren's a good man or hey Layton's a good man uh, Chris Harris he's a good man or James White he's a good man um, Mark, John MacArthur he's a good man what what are qualities external qualities that we see in people who are good well one they they provide for those in need um, they're gracious they're loving they're kind to people. They don't judge people for the color of their skin or things that they can't control. Um, they, 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 um, they're, they're respectful. Um, th those kinds of things. That, in other words, they have the fruit of the spirit, <laughs> the, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Um, in other words, we, we know what good looks like people. And, and when you, when you interpret a scripture that makes God not look good, then maybe you're interpreting it wrong. Now it could be, there are situations which it could be you don't understand why God's doing what he's doing, and it may look like it's not good from our perspective. I, I, I grant that. In, in apologetics, we get into those kinds of issues. But just because um, something is is in that light doesn't necessarily mean it's the right interpretation. It could be that you've got the wrong interpretation. And that's what we're trying to help people to see is that when you, when you know, you know, I think uh, Jerry Walls that makes the argument that God God had the choice as whether or not he creates, but he doesn't have a choice as to whether or not he loves because he is love. Um, it, it's not a choice of God as to whether he's loving. He is just, that's, that's the nature of who he is. He's love. And so it, choosing to create by, by necessity, he must love that which he creates. And he says, this is not, you know, he says, this is not a weakness on God's part. It, you, would you call it a weakness if if um, I said I can't strangle one of my children to death? Well, of course not. My character would not allow me to do that to my child because my character is too good to strangle one of my own children. Okay, um, God's character is too good that that He would not love that which He chooses to create. So even if you had a guy out on the island that, without laws and everything else, that just you know some. Uh, Aborigine, you know, kind of situation island where no, there's no laws, and he has a a tribe of children um, that are from from his seed. That he ultimately is the master over this island. If if he arbitrarily chooses to be kind to some of his kids, even though they're just as evil and and manipulative and and bad as other kids that he treats. Um, in a, in a much harsher way. In other words, he punishes these people endlessly, but this, this 10% or so he treats very nicely and good. Um, you would automatically say, well, that's not a good man. He's, he's, he's choosing to be really kind to some of that, which he chose to conceive. And he's choosing seemingly arbitrarily, capriciously just to, you know, almost randomly pick these other kids that he's going to punish endlessly for the same kinds of evil that these special ones are doing. What, why, why would you, what, why would you call that man an evil dictator and capricious? Because for all practical purposes, that's exactly what he's doing. He's, he's treating all of that, which he's chosen to conceive unfairly and partially. And he's picking some of them and doing really nice things to them. And these others, he's choosing to punish endlessly. And they're exactly the same character. They all come from his seed. And all of us would know that that's wrong. That's that's not that's not fair. That's not right. That's not just. And so it, it this is why, in order to adopt that system or way of thinking, you've got to surrender your sense making, go against all intuition, because even as R.C. Sproul argues, we're all born Pelagian. He says, yeah, everybody's born Pelagian, and he even goes to argue everybody in the church basically is a Pelagian. Even even in other words, even regenerate men are basically Pelagian. Is what he argues in his his book that we went through. And what's he arguing? Your natural intuition given to you by God's decree, because remember, there's no rogue molecules. So <laughs> Calvinism. So God gives us the intuition of being Pelagian. And of course, for the Calvinists, that means to believe people are responsible and actually have free choices, apparently. 
um, and, and aren't born with this decree to hate God from birth kind of concept, because that, that's what they mean by Pelagian. And so why would God give us that intuition? Even as regenerate people, why would we naturally have that intuition? Um, that, that has to be, has to be understood from both perspectives. Um, do you want to jump in on that before I go through some of these starred comments? No, I'm, I'm still calming down. I got a little riled okay. up, man. I'm, I'm just over I, here. I think this is one of those things that's uh, justified to get riled up about. Um, Dustin Paulson, thank you for your super chat. Who are you, old Calvinists, to presume to speak for God? That needs to be the response to them every time they presuppose their doctrines. That's a, yeah, that's a, that's a good retort. Um, when, yeah. who are you to talk back to God? Who are you to think you're speaking for God? Cause I'm not talking back to God. I'm talking about to you, uh, in your theology. Yeah. Uh, very, very good point. Oh, um, uh, Vida, Vida, yeah. uh, I do have some Chrysostom. I've seen your quotes over there. I've got some Chrysostom. I've got, I've got a little, got a little extra for you. So just be patient. Okay. We'll get there then. Chris Harris, two, uh, two super chats are basically, asking the same question. And so I'll, I'll present one of them here. Are infants in, inherently worthy of heaven? If not, why not for, uh, from what you present? If so, it means infants either enter heaven apart from being in Christ or by their own worth. Um, my, my initial act question is to say, why would you assume infant infants are inherently unworthy of being in the presence and with God, if he's created them for that chief end, the chief end of man is to love God and glorify him forever. He's created us to be with him. So why wouldn't he want us with him? Psalm 139, 14, Leighton, I will give thanks to you because I'm awesomely and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. And my soul knows it very well. The wonderful works of God bring honor to God when we recognize that they're wonderful works. Like they were created for this. It's a wonderful thing. Children are created in this state, right? Psalm 58, 3, the wicked go astray. It, it, there's a deviation. There's a corruption that occurs. But you're going to sit back and go, why are they worthy? They're created wonderfully. These, these, are the, these, are, these are the work of God. And you're coming over here. You're not just you know despising the little ones when Christ said not to. You're despising the work of God. He's the one who created them. You go, who needs that? It's are a they low- deserving of punishment? Chris, let me ask you that question. Are infants deserving of punishment and why? That, that, that's how to turn that back. And also, are you worthy of heaven? You're a believer. You've been regenerate. You've been picked by God. Are you worthy of heaven? I think you would say, what? No, no more so than the prodigal son was worthy of being restored as a son. Of course, you're not worthy of that. God is gracious and good. We're not trying to argue that anyone is worthy or deserves the glory and goodness of what God has given to us in an eternal bliss in heaven. No, 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 nobody's trying to argue that we, we are owed that or we're worthy of that. We're, we're arguing for the goodness and the graciousness of a God who has created us in his image for the purpose of having fellowship with him. That's what we're arguing for, brother. And for this concept to be entered in, put in based upon a Latin misreading of Romans 5, this entire doctrine is based upon that, by the way, because if I'd have played all of James White's clip, that's what he basically argues against the typical Baptist and the John MacArthur view is that they have a low view of original sin and federal headship. And because they don't really take seriously Romans chapter five is basically what he argues there. And, and, and so all of this is really hinging upon an Augustinian misrepresentation and misinterpretation from the Latin of Romans chapter five, basically saying all infants are born guilty for what Adam did. And even, even in reform circles like Millard Erickson, like Eric Zwingli and others did not go so far as to believe and teach that we are automatically inherently guilty for what Adam did. Um, and I know that's raging Pelagian. You know what I've determined by the word Pelagian? It's equivalent to the leftist who cries out racist at every turn. It's, it's the, it's the, I don't want to have to debate your logical points. I'm just going to assume you're a racist and I'm not, I don't have to, I don't have to deal with your, your views. I can just call you a racist and then I can just label you, dismiss you as a racist, no matter what your history has shown you, no matter what views you hold to. And so what's, what the word Pelagian has become is it's become just like the leftist use of the word racism. It's, it's a way to, it's a cancel culture way of getting rid of people, not having to deal with their arguments. 
I'll just call him a Pelagian and I don't have to deal with it anymore. And, and I think that that's a really lazy man's approach to an otherwise good, healthy theological discussion that we need to be having about the nature of man and the nature of grace, not to mention the character and the goodness of our God and his provisions. Solitary Emmy, thank you for your super chat. He says, I almost forgot about those that say they will rejoice at the people burning in hell, probably even the babies, crazy people. They need to be reexamined. Yeah, and you you put that quote up there. I think it was from Edwards well, on I've got Twitter. A, I've got not just a quote from Edwards, but I have a video of R.C. Sproul uh, basically embodying the same spirit. I'm going to say energy this time. As, uh, as Edwards. I don't think that's going to be as controversial. Um, but he was embodying the same uh, energy as Edwards when he said, oh, yeah, like you're going to celebrate God throwing your mother into hell. Your friends, your family, all the unelect. He's like, you're going to celebrate. No, yes, I don't you believe you. Let me find it. I'll pull that up while you. Uh, while you I don't about. believe you. I'm telling you, R.C. Sproul, man. You're really misrepresenting R.C. Sproul. You R. have C. to be. R.C. Sproul, man, his, his mama. He's, his, yep. he's not even a super lapsarian, isn't he? Isn't he like more of an infra? Ah, surely not. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull this up real quick. Oh. Surely not. All right, you me, got it. Let me share you, this you must quick. have heard it. You must have heard it with Pelagian ears. That if you might, didn't have Pelagian ears, you might have heard it r- rightly. Might, I've never. I listened to a lot of of him, and I never heard him say anything like that. That's you. You tell me when you're ready. outrageous. It's you it's ready? it's shared. There it is. All right, here we go, guys. Students, and we were seated around the table with a professor, and one of the students ask the question, Dr. Gerstner, how can I be happy in heaven if I am aware that one of my loved ones is in hell? And Gerstner snapped around and looked at this man and he said, don't you know that when you're in heaven, you will be so sanctified that you will be able to see your own mother in hell and rejoice in that, knowing that God's perfect justice is being carried out. And while the student who asked that question shrunk back in horror, his face turning white, I burst out laughing. I just stopped laughing. And he looked at me and says, What's so funny? I said, oh, excuse me, Dr. Gerson. I said, I said, I can't believe you just said what you just said. I said, Nobody talks like that. Yeah, so, that's what I was I'm thinking. thinking. This I wouldn't guy's laugh nuts. about it, though. I'll be happy. I'll be so sanctified in heaven that I could look into the pit of hell see my mother there and be gracious and be glad. I can't imagine anything more ridiculous than that. Oh, well, good. Yes. Well, he does say so it's ridiculous. There you go. I make the thought of it now. Listen to this. This word tells me that the day will come where I will be so concerned about the glory of God and of Jesus that I will be able to rejoice in his judgment. We're not there yet, folks. But that is our destiny. So essentially, essentially here you have, you have R.C. Sproul gaslighting you. And, and he's, he's trying to say, you're going you're gonna to be so sanctified, you're going to cheer your mother and your loved ones being tossed into hell. It's, okay, it's gaslighting. Let, it's gaslighting. Let, 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 me, let me defend something here. Because on our view, whether it's your mother or your child, a loved one, the you know people you can love in, love as much as you can, there is a sense of truth in the sense that if justice is truly being served because someone spits in the face of a God who loves and provides for them. And you, maybe your mother, not my mom certainly hasn't. She's one of the most godly people I've ever met in my life. But um, somebody probably watching this has a mother who's lived a life like that, who's spit in the face of God and has denied a God all her life and has gone to the grave 
denying Christ. Um, I, I would think there is a sense in which there can be some truth in that you can find solace in glory, recognizing that despite God's provision and long suffering and love for your mother and provision for your mother, she is now experiencing the justice of ultimately being one who rejected a God who loved and provided for her. And thus she's getting exactly what she deserves because she spit in the face of a God who loves and provides for her. And so talking from our vantage point, using again, the same vocabulary, different, different, different dictionary, some of what R.C. Sproul may be saying there can be in a good apologetic if you understand God's justice from the right vantage point. But when a Calvinist says something like that, it's just so, it seems so counterintuitive because the person, your mother's in hell because God didn't ever love her, didn't ever want her. That's the that's the rub, Leighton, because you're not celebrating some sense of justice of God wherein he is condemning the wicked who have rejected him, who he had made a genuine offer to. You're celebrating the justice of God in which there's this sense of capriciousness that he just said from all eternity, I don't, I don't not only do I not like your mom, I hate her. And and this isn't just your mom, this is all your loved ones. This is those infants we're talking about. This is all the unelect. It's it's there's no justice in that. You're calling it justice, but you've yet to defend why that's just. Oh, well, it's just because we assume our anthropology based on a bad reading of Romans 5:12. No, you, you've got to make that argument. You've got to defend that. Let's do that. Where are you? Let's let's bring that to the table. But they're not doing that. And so you see, you see, Sproul says, he laughs and he goes, I don't even know how you can get there, but I know one day we will. Why? Because what he's doing is he's 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 switching mindsets. He's coming at this and going, I don't I can't justify that, but one day I'll understand, meaning that God has like justice and, and good reasons. Maybe one day he'll understand those reasons. We're saying, yeah, God's reasons are that he loved, that he offered, and it was rejected. This isn't some divine mystery that you need to get to heaven in order to understand. It's it's evident. He's told us. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have to go into the cognitive dissonance and appeal to the other side of heaven, and then there'll be some great revelation where I may understand it. We know why why people are going to not go into eternal life. It, it's because they've rejected the one who made a genuine offer for that to them, and this this is this is a, a willful rejection. Infants don't have that. Infants don't have that. But in, in his view, it's it's just a kind of a. I, I, don't, I don't. I don't. I know you. You're getting some issues with arbitrary, but that's that's really what it is. Yeah. Um. You know. I'm. You know. I struggle with that. I. I yeah. I don't want to go down that road. I was going to get into the whole um, doctrines of hell and annihilationism and all those kinds of things. And I'm. I still need to study more on that. And I've. And I really am trying to be objective on my views on that. Um. Because I, I want to be very biblically based, and I'm. I'm really struggling with some of the views from both perspectives and I, and I get flack from people from both sides uh, for not taking a hard stand on any issue. Um, but it, there, there's certain, there's certain things that I don't, I don't want to take a stand on something unless I'm fairly confident of my view of something, because I, I believe it or not, people may not think this, but I don't, I, I really don't want to mislead people. <laughs> so I really don't want people to, to believe something that's false based upon, I, I'm so, scared of that because I did it for so long, for 10 years. I I mean, I was a college minister as a Calvinist. I led a lot of young people into Calvinism. And so I, I tread real lightly sometimes when it comes to the, the doctrines that I'm still uh, grappling with. And so well, I, I, don't I, I don't think, know that I don't I think go for there. the purpose of our critique, it really matters. Whether, whether God is throwing a, an infant into eternal torment or destroying them, um, because you're saying that the, it's the, the judgment of God yeah. He's on this and, infant, you know. Yeah, and I wasn't even talking about the infants. I was kind of thinking of the mother situation, even you know, oh, because oh, okay. of yeah. of how that might work. Um, whether you know whether she receives eternal life because she's she she's born again because she believes she puts her faith in Christ, she's born again, and so receives eternal life versus conditional uh, mortal immortality. Um, and so yeah, let's not go there for right now. We we might do an episode on that one of these days. Maybe I get Chris even on to to come talk about it, but um. Chris was I, I the don't. very first guest I ever brought on an idol killer. Chris Date, because no, I was good. on the fence too. I was, I, 
I would I would look and I would read it and I go, I, I'm an I'm an eternal conscious torment guy. I'd read it again. I go, I don't know, conditionalism. Chris was the very first guest I brought on, a Calvinist, by the way. And uh, we sat and talked about this. And uh, it really kind of helped me kind of get my thoughts together on the doctrine. I have a, a lot of respect for Chris because of that. Well, I was real disappointed in um, Al, uh, Al, Al Mohler and his debate with Chris on the Unbelievable program because I was I was really wanting a, a, to hear a good, strong defense of the traditional view on that on hell, and he didn't give one at all. Uh, Chris walked all over him and then some. Um, and so I haven't I was, seen that. I haven't seen that. I'm not surprised though. Even if Mueller brought his A yeah. game, Chris is a mean debater. So I'm, I don't. That doesn't surprise. No, Chris just stomped him and and <laughs> and then ate his lunch. It was really really. And, and the the only thing Mueller basically just kept appealing to authority. That's all that all he did over and over. Tradition and authority. Everybody believes what I'm saying, you know. And only a few people have disagreed with me. That that, that was basically his only his only rebuttal. Um, and so I, I would, I would like to see a better argument from the other side and, uh, I'm sure there's out, there's those out there. I just haven't taken the time to study a lot of it, to be honest. Um, Chris Harris does make a clarity here. My point was according to your view, infants do not need Jesus to enter heaven. J Jesus is the third person of the triune God. So that's like saying we don't need God to enter heaven. Heaven wouldn't exist. That's like, that's like saying, uh, the prodigal doesn't need the father to, um, uh, to, to be restored as his son and to eat the, the fatted calf and to be restored. What? <laughs> Heaven wouldn't exist if not for God, the Father and, and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I mean, the, everything comes from him. Everything that we have comes from him. And so, of course, we need God to enter heaven. Uh, you know, again, it's, it's one of those things. It's kind of a cognitive dissonance. It's like, oh, you think infants deserve heaven. And therefore, God has to save them, and God's and God has to take them to heaven. No, God didn't have to create heaven. He could just annihilate people. He could just say, "No, there's no more after this life. This is all over." The the, the fact that He kills the fatted calf and throws a party and restores the son—that's all grace. That's above and beyond. Nobody deserves that. Infants or anybody, as far as I can tell. What what you what do you want to say to that? Well, I was going to say like you're you're conflating forgiveness with deliverance from mortality as well. Because we can say that the baby has no inherited guilt, that they're not guilty before God, but they're still mortal. They still need saved from the grave. They still need saved from a world of sin. They still need saved from a, a place of suffering, the consequences of sin. So we can say that, you know, Je Jesus is the one that's saving them from the grave. I mean, that's why he died and rose again. He's saving us from our mortal state. That does death does not inherently right. There's still a curse that to be guilty. covered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and so he's conflating those, but it, this is what happens when we kind of compact all of these. One of the things that I've seen that's arisen out of this debate is this question of what it even means to be saved, and uh, a lot of times they'll confuse that and conflate that with just forgiveness. They'll they'll just isolate it to that one key component, and they don't look about being reconciled, being delivered from the grave. Um, you know, understanding and being, they don't look at all of the things are the healing of, so we, we kind of condense it and we end up losing some of the nuance here, but I would say that babies are mortal. You know, the, the babies that die need to be saved from the hold of the grave, whether you're, you're still saying they're in Sheol and Hades, or you think that they've gone to heaven or they're in Abraham's bosom. doesn't matter. It's irrelevant to the debate. They need Jesus. He's the one that's going to resurrect. He's the one that accomplished. He's the one that secured the victory. They need Jesus. Not only that, he's their creator and sustainer. They need Jesus. You don't have to say somebody is has to be guilty in order to need uh, God. Adam needed God, and he wasn't guilty until he sinned. Are we going to say that Adam didn't need God until he sinned? It's silly. It's it, it's 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 not a consistent it's not a consistent argument. Yeah, well said. I, I like the way you explain that. Um, d does Adam and Eve need God prior to their eating of the forbidden fruit? Of course they do. He sustains their very being. Um, and and there's a curse. I mean, this is what we've talked about before. It's what James White seemed to be defending in that article in 1987, that there is a curse and this world we're broken. Um, there's, 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 there's something to be said for the fact that we need Christ because of we're cast out of the garden. He's the one who provides the new tree by which we can take and eat and have life. And so, um, yeah, we all, we all need, we all need Christ in that sense. We just don't need, 
uh, we don't, uh, an infant, an aborted baby doesn't need Christ to pay for his sins because he hasn't sinned. But it doesn't mean he doesn't need his God. He doesn't need Jesus. I mean, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just, well, it's, Jesus it's, is, Jesus is the way. Do babies need a way? Yes, they do. Jesus is the truth. Do babies need truth? Yes, they do. Jesus is the life. Do babies need life? Yes, they do. Do babies need forgiveness because they're uh, tax fraud and their adultery and eating of the forbidden fruit in Eden? No, they don't. So again, we're, we're condensing it. We're rolling it all in. We're assuming your anthropology when you when you bring that question here and you're missing the whole argument because of it. Yeah, yeah, well said. Um, okay, well, what I would like to do now is to bring in this video um, it's from Daily Theology. Uh, I'm not sure this guy's name. I probably should have looked that up. That uh, would have been nicer uh, for me to be able to, re re uh, to refer to him by name. Um, I'm looking on his thing here. Um, you don't happen to know his name, do you? I, I don't. Um, okay. Well, maybe he'll introduce himself as we go. But uh, Daily Theology is the name of the broadcast. And uh, and so he was he's he was um, responding to the whole uh, bail argument thing. And he brings up some points that I think are worthy of us uh, maybe going through and talking about just a little bit. Um, so let's, let's do that. Let me know sound wise if this is coming through. Okay. And we'll go from, well, it's here. not every day that atheists who believe nothing created everything, even though they'll say, I don't believe that, uh, agree with provisionalists and people that basically Oops. spend their entire ministry advocating against God's unconditional choosing and grace for whomever he wishes to save. But in this short clip, you're going to see something that maybe you thought you would never see. And then James White is going to explain what exactly. Okay, so obviously he's a James White fan because he's using James White's talking points, yeah. which is all these guys ever do is X, Y, Z. And that's based upon all I know of these guys is what I've watched on Sociology 101, the podcast created to confront these issues. It would be a tantamount to me going onto the uh, Dallas Cowboys fan page and picking somebody out who was posting there and saying, all you ever do is talk about the Dallas Cowboys. And the guy goes, uh, actually, I'm a, a doctor and a physician and I do this and I have children and um, I'm a painter. Um, I, you know, I rock climb. I do all these other things too. Um, oh, well, I never hear you say anything about any of those things. Oh, you mean on the Dallas Cowboys fan page? Uh, you never hear me talk about all those other things. Maybe because I'm on the Dallas Cowboy fan page to talk about the Dallas Cowboys. So, sorry. <laughs> I'm just like, this page was created separately yeah. to talk about these doctrines. And you think this is all these guys ever do. Come on, people. Uh, that, that, that talking point is, uh, old. Uh, so get a new one. Right. Exactly is grace. And I want to explain why this is connected to the idea of nothing creating everything. So it actually connects atheism and free will and this abomination of a clip Layton of like well you know if i'm elect and my children aren't you know that's okay and i just wanted to highlight how that's the same kind of spirit and mindset that the ancient worshipers of pagan deities would engage in when they would sacrifice their children to Baal. because as long as i get my good crops i'm willing to throw my child on the pyre as long as i am being blessed financially i'm willing to throw my child on the pyre it's the same mindset where they're like well god may have eternally reprobated my child but as long as i get into heaven i'm cool with that i don't know about you guys but i mean i've got four children if god's the kind of god that would reprobate your child how do Layton, you have just, the kind of worship and love for that version Layton, of God? I, Layton, 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 Layton. You're just making God in your own image. You just want God to be to be like you. You want him to align with your own moral standards. And who are you? How about, man how about the image God? of 1 Corinthians 13? How, how about that image yeah, of God? How about, that? How about it? Mm -hmm. it makes so 1 Corinthians 13 has nothing to do with this passage. God is love. Uh, it has everything to do. Uh, first Corinthians 13 describes what God's, what love is. And, and as you, he goes on to say, God is love. And yes. So how do we know the character and the goodness of God? Because the Bible tells us what God looks like. He tells us what love is. So yes, it has everything to do with this discussion. And the fact that, that Calvinists like this think that God's inspired word defining what love is and defining what God looks like has nothing to do with a debate over the character of God is baffling to me. Well, well, not only that, but the, the, the context of the critique is infant damnation. And I don't think this video even, even addresses that. Um, I don't think, I don't no, think he, he ever... assumes like white does that 
you are comparing all Calvinists to Baal worshipers and that if you're a Calvinist, then you are the same as a bell worshiper and yeah. can't believe that I wouldn't have responded to that. And obviously anybody who knows anything about me and my continual defense, I get more critique mail from people mad at me for defending Calvinists than I do of any other critique of not calling them heretics and throwing them out of the kingdom. And yet you think that I, th I was okay with Warren saying every Calvinist is just like a worshiper of Baal who sacrifices their kids. That's obviously not the point he was making in the context of the video as we've gone over. Well, this um, gentleman, I don't think he even watched the original video. He's just playing the short. And so I think, I think one of the things that's come out of this Baal gate uh, or Baal gate is one infant damnation is a doctrine, a teaching that uh, some Augustinian traditions hold to that needs to be rejected because it's not biblical. It's disgusting. That that's point one. I think the other point that this shows is for all uh, in the YouTube space that if you see a short before commenting on it, you probably want to try and find the original source to make sure you're verifying the context. So not to beat up too much on this guy, about a month or so ago, I saw a video where a man was responding to one particular doctrine that I thought I knew what he was saying. And I had, I was so offended, I was going to go and do a response to it. But I stopped and I said, let me just make sure that this thing that he's addressing isn't mispronunciating another thing that I affirm. And it turned out it was its own thing altogether. And I learned there was this whole other error out there. And I was like, oh, I actually agree with this guy now. So I didn't do that response, right? Because we're in agreement. So I don't know if this gentleman actually would be in agreement with MacArthur, Piper, you, me, um, that, that infant damnation is wrong. He may actually be in agreement with us and doing a response, critiquing us, not knowing what we were talking about. Right. That's, that's, that's all possible. So one of the, the, the good benefits, I think, of this is not only have we exposed infant damnation as, as antithetical to Scripture, but that as YouTubers, we need to be very careful. And, and I think consumers of content not just you and me and him and White and Marlin and all the other guys that are jumping in on this, but as consumers of online content, we need to be very careful before we go in and make a quick rush to judgment. If something can sound awful, but then we go and we look into it and we go, actually, okay, I get it now. And, yeah. uh, and so I don't want to uh, uh, attack this gentleman too much, but I did ask him in the comments, sir, I did ask you in the comments, if you knew this was on infant damnation, and if so, would you take a stand for or against it? And instead I got I'll, something to the effect of, I think it was, I'll pray for you, which is not, 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 okay. If you scroll down, you'll see blasphemy. Calvinists are like Baal worshipers. Never said that. Uh, I was talking about the spirit of infant damnation. And, uh, and it would be nice, right? I mean, I could come in here and go, is he putting words in my mouth? I think he is. I'm going to try and be charitable because I don't think he actually understood the context. But I want you to take a stand, sir. You're a, you're a content creator. Everybody wants to know, do you affirm the belief, like James White, that God throws infants, non-elect infants, into, into hell? I don't think that's that's too hard of a question. Just take a stand on it. Be, be hot or cold. Don't be lukewarm. Let us know. Yeah, I think that um, if he's gonna if he's gonna do a video on it, he needs to probably take a position as to where he stands on that. If he's agreeing with White, then say so, and then and then defend your position. Um, and and let me try to help people to understand the mindset that we're coming at when talking about that. If if you were to come across a cult that's out there, just the just a weird, the, the, you know, some of those cults that everybody kills themselves by, you know, they do this mass, you know, get on everybody get up on the roof and they all. Uh, ingest something and they all die because they believe these things and they, they, you know, the cult like mentality Well, they'll just surrender their sense making over to their cult leader and they will believe and just take in whatever's told to them and they will just follow and, and believe everything they're saying. Right now, again, I'm not trying to compare anybody to that and the, the Calvinist or when I was a Calvinist that I was that way. I'm not trying to say any of those things. Okay? We need what to get Jordan to is, do a one minute clip of that and post that to Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> just, just say that. <laughs> well, Leighton said we're just like the cults. No, what, I, what I'm trying to get you to say is, have you ever sat around and thought about how does somebody get so far into believing something so asinine as that? How, how do they get there? It didn't just happen overnight. How, how do they get brainwashed into thinking something so absolutely 
un- inconceivable. It, it really, that's the word, the word inconceivable. How, how did they do- adopt something so inconceivable that which RC Sproul was laughing at his, his mentor saying just inconceivable that somebody would even say this because it's just, ah, you know, how in the world do you get to that point where you're willing to swallow an inconceivable pill, so to speak, because the inconceivable pill is so big I don't know how it's going to go down, but my goodness, there's no way that could ever go down. It's just inconceivable that I would ever swallow that belief system. Okay. Whatever it is. And what, what Warren was trying to do is to say the pagan worshipers who are willing to swallow this inconceivable pill of child sacrifice to give up their child for the good of their crops and the land and the good of uh, of them not being per- not perishing because that's ultimately what they're doing. They're saying, I sacrifice my child so that we don't perish. We, we get to be saved. And, and I'm, I'm okay to do this because I have swallowed this inconceivable pill of believing Molech, believing in this false deity that I would be willing to give up my own child and adopt this inconceivable worldview. And he's saying is, it is it there there is a there is a same kind of a cognitive dissonance for those who are willing to swallow what white used to think was this inconceivable pill of infant damnation that our god the god that we worship that we sing songs about that we say we give our lives to is willing to punish in eternity infants that die or ba- babies that are aborted but we're still willing to worship him because after all, he did elect us. He is saving us. He is blessing us. And we may not get it yet, but as Sproul just argued, eventually we're going to come to love this about our God, even though it seems so inconceivable to us that that pill that you're willing to swallow, it's another way of saying surrendering your sense-making, being willing to swallow the inconceivable. That That's the same kind of spirit. It's the same kind of mindset, so to speak. It's the same kind of way of thinking that you're willing to adopt whatever's being fed to you in order to make it fit your worldview and your system, even if it's completely out of bounds and just way out there. Like, wow, I can't believe. And you're almost looking back going, wow, I cannot believe I went so far as to believe that. I can't believe I, and that's that's the way we as former Calvinists kind of feel. We kind of like, we're looking back over our life and going, I can't believe I was duped to thinking that one at one time. What, why did I just swallow that? Why did I just believe that? I can't believe that I even swallowed that pill. Um, and, and that's what I think that we're trying to get to is we're trying to help people to sh- shock them out of their system and their worldview of saying the, the fact that, that there are many Calvinists, most Calvinists, who are not willing to swallow the inconceivable pill of infant damnation, that there are people like Sproul and Piper and others standing up against that doctrine should at least introduce you, if nothing else, to the the your willingness to to swallow an inconceivable pill that even leading Calvinists are not willing to swallow. That should at least shock you enough to go, what am I doing here? Where have I let myself go? Um, and and that's that's I think that's the way I took Warren's comment in the context of our discussion. Is that pretty fair, Warren? Kind of. I think, trying, I think trying to yeah. hash out what it is you were trying to get people to understand. Well, and, and you know, and it was, it was something that I had spent three weeks typing up and analyzing in a very, I've got a white paper coming out to defend those statements. <laughs> it's going to go up before a theological commission for, uh, for grading uh, all of my notes and sources and citations are there. Uh, it took a lot of effort for me to make that comment too. So, you know, um, <laughs> I think it deserves the utmost of scrutiny. Um, <laughs> That's that's Warren's satirical way of saying it was an offhanded comment in a very long discussion. Uh, you're reading way more into it than what was what was meant. Yes, yeah, that's it. I, that's, I appreciate. That's well, well said. I appreciate that people think that I'm that well reasoned and thought out. You know that that everything <laughs> that I say is uh, is that uh, that well thought out. I, I appreciate. It. I stand by my comments. I stand by what I said. But the uh, the 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 fuel that they. Uh, added to this was was rather surprising, and it, you notice after the video went out, it was a non-event. But that rascal Jordan with his one-minute clip, <laughs> it was him. It was him. Yeah, okay. he he takes all the blame. That's it. All right, let, let's go on with the video. Here we go. Love, and that is true. But if God does not save people that you know, does that mean then you hate that God? Because that seems to be the okay. Obviously, 
we don't believe that God will save everyone that we love because I may love someone who rejects God. Um, that that's not the point of distinction. That's not our point of contention, brother. Um, but I believe that God loves that person and desires their salvation. If I believe that God hated that person and reprobated them before they were born, then it would be very difficult for me to love that version of God, knowing what I know now. Uh, it's the same thing as, as C.S. Lewis argued, the same thing that uh, Roger Olson argued, the uh, same thing Wesley argued, is that if I adopted what your claims are, about God are true, then it would be really difficult for me to love and worship that version of God. Um, I would have to be determined to love that version of God. And that, that's, that's the whole point, um, is that if, if what you're saying is true, it would require effectual, irresistible grace because I, I couldn't adopt that way of thinking about God and still choose to love him because I can't swallow that pill. And now maybe God just made me where I can't swallow that pill. He's opened my eyes to where I can't, I can't swallow. I don't know. Again, it, it's either, it's either I'm right in defending the glory and the goodness of God, or God is determined for me to be wrong for the praise of his glory. There's no really two ways about that. Uh, um, and so I, I don't know how else to, to make that more, that point more well, clear. I think, I think, one of the reasons for this argument is again, he's using the one minute clip and not looking at the context of the video because he says, we're arguing like atheists essentially that, you know, if God is God and all loving and all good, that old uh, Euthyphro uh, dilemma, like why doesn't he save everybody? We're yeah. not making that argument. We're saying he's made a provision for everybody. Like we don't even have that dilemma there. Um, but so I think he's approaching this through the one minute clip as filtered through White's criticism of it rather than going to the original video, looking at the context and going, okay, I understand. Let me engage with those issues. So I, I don't even think he's, he's engaged with us yet uh, in this. Yeah. All right. Tone and the uh, assumption of what they're saying there that I could never love a God like that. Now we all want our children to be saved. And the problem with this video uh, is that this is a, actual true look into the heart of what these guys believe they could never love a guy like that so they they're making up this monster of a god that atheists often will point to and say this is your god he does all these evil things this is why he's evil he's the author of evil and they're saying well, we're not we're not making god into the monster we're, we're reporting what calvinists say about god which which leads people to conclude that he must be monstrous and therefore we're defending against that view. It's like even, even John Piper, there's a video of him responding to a young lady who says, I can't swallow the pill of determinism and Calvinism. And so, um, what, you know, what I do, and he actually, to his credit, gives her as I would much rather you be an Armenian in heaven than to reject God altogether. And so he's making the argument, even you don't have to believe in Calvinism to be a Christian. And so that that's our point here is that when people see the Calvinistic version of God, especially the high Calvinist that believes in an in, in infant damnation as being monstrous. We're trying to, we're, we're giving a defeater as an apologist. What's a defeater? Here is a possible better interpretation of God than what you have been taught. And therefore you don't need to reject God on those basis because there are most, not only a majority, but a good number of well-intending good Christians who don't believe those things. So you don't have to be one of those kinds of Christians to be a Christian. That's the point. You want to comment on that well, one? He, he said that we're saying that this, this depiction of God is monstrous. So if he understands that the criticism is of infant damnation, then I think something, you know, like out of the heart, the mouth speaks uh, out of the abundance. That, I think when he says that, that what we're critiquing here is monstrous, that this God would throw infants into torment. I would say I think that is a monstrous depiction. It's a it's a warp interpretation of scripture. It's not it's not the God revealed in scripture. But if if he does truly see it as monstrous, then why is he siding with James White who teaches it? See, I I, I, yeah. I think there's some real breakdown in his understanding of what we were criticizing, what White was responding to. So I think in this is a case where we're probably speaking way past each other and not engaging in the the substance of the criticism, and uh, and so. I would just encourage him to, again, look at the information that's come out, make a decision on whether or not you support infant damnation or not, and then take a tough stand, live or die by it, and be willing to be corrected, right? I'm still, saying, yeah, yeah, as I passionate can as I am, Sorry. as passionate as I am, if somebody could come in and make a biblical argument, you know, I don't know, somebody who's got a huge ministry, who has a history of seasoned debate, uh, if, if somebody who held this would be willing to take this up and debate me, I am a reasonable person. And it is possible that they can make such a strong 
convincing argument from the text of scripture that I would be persuaded to again adopt my past held beliefs, which I, I again, like I held these beliefs, right? Because I thought that's what the Bible taught. I thought that's what God was like. And so that was the bitter pill I was willing to swallow. So if I could swallow it then, it stands to reason that somebody could convince me to swallow it now. So maybe if James White would be willing to take this up, he might be the one to convince me to return to the bitter pill. Only if God decrees it. But if God yeah. decrees it, yeah. <laughs> of course. I could never love a God that doesn't save the children of believers, but we know that God doesn't save the believers' children in every scenario. Does that mean that you don't have the Holy Spirit in you saying that you love God, that you've been changed from light, uh, from darkness to light, that you're not a new creation, that your children need that same transformation? I mean, our affections have been changed, and grace is not something that you can command or demand of God for anyone, even yourself. That's what makes it grace. It's not a potential offer. It's an actual work of God. Okay. So, okay. I think, so I think when he's yeah, talking about children, I think he's talking about grown adults that, that have made their choice and they've right. gone into apostasy and they've rejected the faith. You notice he, he says children, but I think we're speaking past each other. I don't think he's going, oh, Warren made he's a comment. He's not addressing about, infant damnation. Yeah. yeah Warren made a comment about pagans throwing babies on an altar. Therefore, he was really trying to say, Warren was criticizing throwing 35 year old apostates onto the fire. It's not this, they're missing the point of the, the analogy entirely at that point. So I'm not coming in saying some 35 year old apostate who got angry and ran into a life of sin and rejected God and hardened his heart and died therein somehow needs to be saved because his, his dad was a faithful Christian. I'm, I'm saying we're talking about specifically throwing infants into eternal torment or destroying them at judgment. The, where do we see that in scripture? And, and so I want to make sure the audience knows we're not just talking about offspring, right? Because you can use the English language breaks down. We can talk about children and just be generic offspring from conception in utero all the way to 99 years of age. We're not talking about our offspring. We're talking about infants and young children. Young yeah. children that do not yet know the difference between good and evil, right and wrong. They don't even have the cognitive abilities to understand who Christ is or to accept these mental propositions that we are saying you have to accept to be saved. That's that's the point of contention. Is, is Jesus, is God the kind of God that desires the salvation of all? Is he a good and just judge? And a lot of times you'll hear Calvinists defending infant damnation by saying, well, he's God and we don't understand it, but he's just, and one day we'll understand his justice. What if we understand his justice now, and this is cognitive dissonance that you're encountering, that Jesus does save all the babies? That's what we're arguing. Yeah, exactly. Well, and notice he, he, you could tell he's a student of, of uh, White because he uses the same fallacious arguments. The false dilemma here is that it's either potential or actual. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it, it, instead of it's both and, you know. It's potential for all and actual for those who believe. Uh, so th th that's the whole false dilemma. We we believe in an actual atonement. You just believe in a potential. You know, no, it's it's potential for everyone because it's provided for all. But it's actual for those who look to the sun in healing for healing. And so the the, the same kinds of uh, arguments that uh, White makes fallacious uh, fallacies when you base an argument on a fallacy, it cannot be answered except by pointing out the fallacy. And that, that's the whole point of pointing out fallacies is that the, the, the fallacious argument has to be answered by pointing out its fallacious nature. I remember someone on Twitter got mad at me because, oh, you kept just labeling every every fallacy instead of answering the argument. And, and that is an answer. It's it's an answer. Pointing out the fallacy is the answer because you can't answer a fallacy. That's why that's what it's, a, it's, it's, it's what makes it fallacious. And so uh, that, that's a, a, a common fallacious argument, the actual versus potential uh, is a is a fallacious argument. Grace must be free. Grace cannot be demanded. And nobody is saying grace can be demanded. God didn't have to create heaven. God didn't have to create glory. God didn't have to do anything. <laughs> it, it, God God could be exactly the way the the worst possible person that describes God could ever come. In other words, God may be as as our, our, uh, C. S. Lewis talked about an omnipotent or all powerful demon. Um, it, if he was that, and that's who he was and what he revealed himself through Christ to be, then that's what he would be in this world. 
would be completely capricious and completely God complete completely capricious and arbitrary and all the horrible bad things that happen. Just God, that's just the way God is. And he's not really a good God at all by any reasonable definition of goodness. And that, that could be the way God does things. I don't believe it is based upon revelation of scripture. So what we're debating here is what does God reveal himself to be? Is it, is it demonstrably good and right and just? I believe it is based upon how he defines what's good, right, and just. He's love. And therefore, I, I describe God by the definition of love that he gives us. He gives us that, that, that standard. That's the way he needs to be judged, based upon the standard he gives, not the one that you know your, your doctrinal systematics come up with. Yep, I agree. Grace is, is an effectual power from God that accomplishes his own glorious purposes. And it is free in its exercise by God. If it's demanded, it's no longer grace. It's now a... I give you this, you give me that. It's a it's a quid pro quo type system uh, that most religions have. What makes Christianity different is the grace of God is free. It cannot be demanded. And in fact, it has been rightly said, it's... If, if God is the one who sets the standard, if you do this, then I will do this. If you wipe the blood on the doorpost, then the death angel will pass over. If you look to the serpent lifted on the pole, then you will be healed. Then no one is quote unquote demanding and or uh, making God be gracious. He's going to keep his promise, but he never had to provide that means of healing and provision. The fact that he does so with a provisional qualification, if you do this, then I will do this. If you repent, then I will forgive. Um, if you humble yourself, then I will raise you up. Then God is the one setting the standard. It's God's choice. He's the sovereign. And if he sets it to where you have the freedom to either humble yourself and believe or the freedom to not humble yourself, but harden yourself or uh, trade the truth in for lies and you choose to trade the truth in for lies, then that's your fault because you had the freedom to accept the truth when it was made known to you. Um, and so that's his Danger. He's the one who makes that decision, not us. It's not like the provisionist or typing an email to God saying, ah, God, we really need to make it to where we have a choice in this matter. We're telling you what God has revealed in his scripture is the way of salvation. I don't know how else to be more clear about that. Yeah, we're, 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 <laughs> we're coming in with a biblical argument based on the self-revelation of God. The Calvinist counters with a philosophical entailment of their presuppositions based on a faulty interpretation of scripture. We're both starting, uh, arguably, with the text of Scripture. So now we got to go in and say which one is actually the correct interpretation. Are we going to say that we were all literally in Adam as Augustine understood Romans 5.12? Or are we going to go with the, the Greek fathers and the Hebrew and go, oh, because of whom? You know, are we? Are, how are we going to handle this? And, and I think in, uh, there's an old saying, and I've, I think I've said it on your show before, an honestly mistaken man, when presented with the truth, will either cease being mistaken or cease being honest. Me, when I was sincerely mistaken as a Calvinist, and I thought Augustinian anthropology and all that came with the tulip was true, I loved God, but I was sincerely and honestly mistaken. I was then confronted with the truth of what God was like in Scripture, and I had a choice, right? I could... Consist, I can continue to love my systematic and reject the truth, or I could go where I saw the truth leading me. I had to follow my convictions. And, and that's what led me out of Calvinism because I said, the, the scriptures are true. Let God be true and every man a liar. Where does this take me? If Calvinism crumbles, then it should crumble. But I think sometimes we get into this system where we're, we're scared and we're afraid that if, I know I'll speak to me again. I was afraid that if Calvinism crumbled, Christianity would go with it. And that kept me yeah. in that system far longer than it ever should have. Uh, at the end of the day, yeah. I can trust God. Whether Let's say provisionism turns out to be a fraud this evening, right? Am I, am I a provisionist? Let's say Eastern Orthodoxy or Roman Catholicism or some Protestant trans, uh, category or, or denomination turns out to be fraud. Jesus said he's the way, the truth, and the life. That's foundational. So as long as he's 
the, the way, the truth, and the life, if that's it, I'm going to go wherever he's leading me. The rest of these understandings can fall by the wayside. There's not going to be Calvinists in heaven. And I don't mean you guys aren't saved. I don't, there's not going to be provisionists in heaven. There's not going to be these divisions. There's going to be imagers of Christ. When we see him, we will be like him. And so at the end of the day, what are we committed to? Are we committed to that? Or are we committed to this mold of these presuppositions? And I think that, I think that sometimes that, that, that challenge can be scary. But again, I think this gentleman here just completely missed the entire point of the, the, the statement and the argument. And he's reacting to white reacting to a one minute clip rather than yeah. actually engaging with the, the issues. Yeah, I, I agree. It's not, it's not, it's normally called unmerited grace. It's actually demerited grace. It is favor toward those who rightfully should receive punishment from a holy God. But do, do infants that are aborted in their mother's womb rightly deserve punishment? According to what he said earlier, yes. And that's what we're, that's what we're balking at. That's what we're saying is the inconceivable pill that you used to think was inconceivable too. And, and we're wondering why have you surrendered your sense making? Why do you go against all intuition? Why, why do you go against the God-given conscience that you had in 1987 telling you that's absolutely inconceivable? The only reason you would do that is because of the philosophy, the philosophical systematic worldview that you've adopted is more consistently defended in your debates by, by a swallowing that inconceivable pill. And we're saying you've gone too far and, and people should call that out, yeah. including Phil Johnson or white, or, or I mean, Phil Johnson or Todd Friel or anybody else that believes in uh, universal infant salvation, they should be calling white out on this because he's doing, he's doing a lot of damage to the Christian faith by teaching this inconceivable concept of infant damnation. How, how, do, you, instead, how do you tell, how do you tell an unbeliever that they can trust God, but he'll throw their infant child into eternal torment? Potentially. 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 I always have to say potentially because he'll, yeah. they'll always grab you. Oh, see, so you're, you're saying God's condemning all infants. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't know. I, Calvinists, there may be some out there who hold to, you know, universal damnation of all infants that die because they didn't reach the age they, of faith. They're in my, they're in my comments on my videos. Yes, they do exist. Seriously. Yeah. Yes. And there, he actually and debated. It's almost, that may be an extreme version of, well, that may be the McKenzie guy that he was debating that he references in that article in 1987 might have been that view because well, they have not reached an age where they have faith yet. They're automatically damned. Yeah. It does, that, that, that view extreme. does exist as universal damnation because you have to assent to Calvinistic propositions or some other set of facts you have to understand and assent to. So the, the babies that perish are automatically unelect because they didn't meet the. Because if he'd elected them, then he would have ensured their life through determination because the, everything is determined. And so they're, they're dying before they reach an age of faith proves just like the people who are unconverted uh, are unevangelized and Calvinists argue that they're damned based on the evidence that they never were evangelized because if God determines all things, he would determine them to be evangelized. And if he didn't determine them to be evangelized, then it must be because he didn't want them to be evangelized because they're not elect. And so they conclude that people who aren't evangelized are not elect in the same way. They would take that same logic to the aborted child or to the infant that dies. Well, God determines all things, which means that he determined for that child to die before reaching an age of faith. Therefore they weren't elect. And so you can see how a person can get there philosophically sure. and logically, but I don't know. I have not personally met any Calvinist, um, who makes that leap, but I guess they're, I'm sure they're, it, it's the same. It's the same form of argumentation that leads us to conclude that from all eternity, God loved predominantly white European men more than anybody else, because that's traditionally the, the Calvinist, the, the reformed, those are, those are going to be your generally predominantly white European no, time men. out because I'm going to get criticized for not stopping you on that point. Okay. What, what you're not saying is that Calvinists now all believe that God loves and chooses 
predominantly white uh, European men. Uh, obviously, Piper and MacArthur and White would not believe that God no. chooses to save only white predominantly. No, no, no. Men. And I'm not. I'm not saying that's so. the Calvinist view. I'm saying that line of reasoning or that line of argumentation, because when you look at the span of history, the Reformed are generally white European men. That's the the majority that have right. held that view. Just, that's all. Just, I knew. I knew that's where you were going, but. Either so, you know, yeah, Jordan might come in. From another Jordan country. might come and click this Dude, and Jordan, put it out there. Jordan, 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 <laughs> man, that's a, that's a chance to throw Jordan under the bus if we can. <laughs> <laughs> I love that guy. No, I, I, I bear no animus or angst. I'm not upset. Oh about no, no, it. that's I'm what I was telling you. I'm, I'm thankful that this. I'm thankful that this discussion's come up because it yeah. really is highlighting a major point of of contention with us, and, and helping people to see why this is such a, an important top topic, but. But also, on that point, I mean, the reason you have um, Whitfield and many of the leading Calvinists of that day, back in the day, when before the Civil War and all the things that were happening with all slavery and everything else, um, a majority of those who were in the Calvinistic groups were defenders of chattel slavery, and they would do so on the basis of some of the same kinds of arguments from Calvinists. Um, that there are different classes of people and God has created certain people for certain classes and certain groups. And this isn't this, this is the way God's destined it to be. Um, uh, and again, I know Calvinists today would ap absolutely reprehensible, not trying to say any Calvinists today that I'm, I'm aware of anyway, uh, that would hold to those kinds of hor horrific views, but historically more Presbyterians and reformed Baptist Calvinistic types were more likely to defend. Whereas John, you know, John Wesley and, other free will advocates were abolitionists. And so, um, and, and that, because it more aligned with our theology, your theology will, will influence your methodologies. And when that was the major issue of the day, and those were the debates, you did have more of, and, but that's not, it's not universal. Obviously there were some still free will advocates that were still pro slavery and vice versa. And so I'm not saying it was down the line. What my point is, is that that way of thinking, about how God works and how God determines things and God creating a certain class of people, i.e. the elect to be a certain way and a certain type um, fits in with those kinds of systematic ways of interpreting the text than others. And so that that's one of the, the I think a true criticism of the traditional development of a particular doctrine. I think we have every right to look at those, that development of the doctrines and how it, how they came to be. Um, all right, moving on with video. Here we go. Receive his grace. So the issue here, and people often uh, will wonder, why are you making videos on God choosing and, and emphasizing why we believe? Because it gets to the heart of the self-righteous religious person. It gets to the heart of the atheist, the agnostic. It gets to the heart of the person in the false religion that wants to earn God's favor. You can't. And only Christianity says grace isn't dependent on you. It's dependent on God, the author of all things. And this is significant because God is the creator of all living things. He creates all things from life and DNA, which information always requires a mind, which is why every house has a builder and everything created, including faith, comes from God. God is the author of all things. He's the creator of all things spiritual. So this is this is kind of the basis of the Calvinistic argument that if God's not the creator of faith, um, i.e. effectually causing people to believe, then somehow you believe that you're meriting or earning salvation by believing. Um, and of course, I've spent countless numbers of hours debunking that concept and idea. Um, and even quote from John Piper of all people in an article that he wrote that's there at Soteriology 101 demonstrating why faith, and he never appeals to Calvinism as his reason for this, but he shows why faith is not a meritorious work. Um, you know, asking for forgiveness doesn't merit being forgiven. And we've gone over that so many times. I don't know that I need to repeat it, but, uh, Again, that, that, that's, this is, again, obviously, he's a student of White, and he's repeating the same talking points that, that White has taught him over the years, it sounds like. Spiritual scene, visible, invisible, including your faith. Don't believe me? Check out Hebrews chapter 3. You say, Hebrews 3, how could this prove that? For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, okay? But the builder of all things is God. So creation is evidence of a creator here in Hebrews 3, but also faith 
is made by God. He's the author. Okay, so he's using this verse as a proof text that God causes people to have faith. Uh, everyone's born without the ability to have faith, but he causes the elect to have faith is basically uh, the point he's trying to make. Um, and, and I would just point out and say, uh, one, that verse doesn't say that. Now, God is the author and the prover of our, or the perfecter of our faith, but that's, called, that's a noun, the Christian faith. God creates the Christian faith. God is the writer or the author of the Christian faith. Absolutely. But you're responsible to put your trust in him, to put your faith in him. Uh, and so whenever Calvinists take verses like that out of context to say, this therefore means God causes some people to have faith while everyone else is born by decree, not able to have faith. Again, that, that's just a form of determinism. And I don't see anywhere in the scripture that, that teaches that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you choose to suppress the truth in unrighteousness and not believe it, that's your fault, not a lacking of God's desire or provision for you. Just, just to be very clear on that. The author of all things. And in that clip, uh, James White said that it's it's a it's a work of God. It's it's something uh, that is created by God. I would go a little further and say it's the Holy Spirit producing an effect in the heart of the dead person, just like creation was the effect of Jesus speaking. And now the author of Hebrews makes it clear that Jesus is the creator. He's the radiance of the glory of God. He made all things. And in this example, that all things, it includes your faith. It includes not just a potential redemption, but an actual redemption, an actual Okay, so there it is, the potential versus actual, again, the false dilemma that we already pointed out. Atonement. Let's look at providence here. God, the creator of all things, including your faith, in his infinite power and wisdom, upholds, directs, arranges, and governs all creatures and things from the greatest to the least by his perfectly wise and holy providence to the purpose for which they were created. He governs according to his infallible foreknowledge and the free and unchangeable counsel of his own will. His okay, notice this is not scripture. This is the London Baptist Confession. So he's he's reading Calvinistic doctrine or Calvinistic confessions to support his Calvinistic belief instead of reading from scripture. The, now he referred to scripture earlier, but we saw very clearly how that scripture did not support what he was saying, i.e. that God effectuates faith in some people and not others. Um, the, the fact that God's a creator of all things, all of us agree. The question is, does he create libertarianly free creatures or uh, determined creatures? Um, and so we all believe God creates all things. It's a question of how he's created and how he's, you know, sovereignly chosen to rule this world. His providence leads to the praise of the glory of wisdom, power, justice, infinite goodness, and mercy. Now, within that created order, that created understanding of what a sovereign ruler and creator is, the covenant of grace is revealed in the gospel. It was first revealed of all to Adam, the promise of salvation through the seed of the woman. After that, it was revealed step by step until the full revelation of it was completed in the New Testament. The covenant is based on the eternal covenant transaction between the Father and the Son concerning the redemption of the elect. Only through the grace of this covenant have those saved from among the descendants of fallen Adam obtained life and blessed immortality. Humanity is now utterly incapable of being accepted by God on the same terms in which Adam was accepted in his state of innocence. So the issue here is that faith is created. Faith is a gift. All things come from God. Ultimately, God is a okay. So we would we would agree. I have no problem saying faith is a gift. I just don't think gifts have to be effectually given for God to get all the credit for giving what He gives. <clears throat> faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We can't believe in what we don't know or haven't been revealed. So we need God. We need a conscience. We need the ability to deliberate. We need the ability to reason. God gives us all that. All those things come from God. Um, that's why we're responsible creatures. That's what separates us from the animal. We're not, we're not just acting instinctively based upon how we were created to act given the external stimuli. We have a legitimate ability to deliberate and decide among competing desires which desire we're going to act to fulfill uh, or, to, or, or to, um, to fulfill this particular desire versus this particular desire. We have a choice as to which desire we act to fulfill. Uh, an animal doesn't do that. An animal acts instinctively upon their greatest preset desire, i.e. their instinct. We're not just instinctive beings. We're different than the animals in that regard. Just just to be clear. Do you want to add to that, Warren? Well, I was just going to say, it's, it's, one of the things that, that happens in these kind of videos is, is a, a lot of putting up a passage of scripture and then telling you their presuppositions about what that is supporting. The contention is never what, the contention is never really the text. It's, it's the contention's always that precept, and um, and and it's just it's, it's assumed that okay Calvinist doctrine, that's what this is teaching, that's why we're right, and it's really it's really kind of circular. You mentioned how he was quoting from the uh, the confession, and uh, and and I remember doing the same thing. You know, it's like you you elevate an interpretation of scripture to being the 
interpretation of scripture. Therefore, it can supplant scripture. It can replace scripture. If this is if this is the interpretation of scripture, then then how is it any different than the inspired word of God? And so then you start getting into, and you're not even really aware you're doing it. So I'm not saying this is intentional, but I mean, I, I can speak to my own. Sometimes I would let the, the confession supplant the text so that I was reading the interpretation back into the text. And, well, uh, and that becomes dangerous. It kind of becomes that, that surrendering the sense making thing that we were talking about before is that when you face and you come up against that difficult doctrine, sometimes the safe place you feel is quoting from someone that you know has already been baptized as good, holy, right, and, and authoritative. So if I quote MacArthur saying this difficult doctrine, then I'm safe because I'm not saying anything controversial because basically MacArthur has been baptized in the sense that he's been accepted by the church for the most part. He's, he's, he's an authority. And so if I can quote from this confession or from this authoritative figure, then I don't have to really deal with the ultimate implications of the claim because it's not really my claim. It's the claim of this group, this, this consensus of these people. And so it, it kind of, it kind of provides that, that barrier, so to speak of not having to live with the, the full weight of a, a conclusion you're drawing because you're, you're ultimately reading the conclusion of a, a group of authoritative figures, at least in your mind. And so I get it. I, I mean, I, we do the same thing. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that we, we don't also do the same thing. There's things that, that I will read from, from, you know, leading provisionists like C.S. Lewis. When I, when I quote from C.S. Lewis, he's been baptized in a sense. He's seen as an authority. He's seen as a smart guy that people look up to. And so when I quote from him, I'm giving some weight to my argument. So I get that. But at the same time, I've got to be willing to live with the, that argument as a claim of my own. And, and recognizing C.S. Lewis as not the authority, he can be wrong. Um, and therefore I'm not basing it on what C.S. Lewis is saying. I'm using C.S. Lewis to support what I believe the scripture is ultimately saying. And he's one who believes like I do with regard to what the scripture is saying, which I, I can assume that maybe that's why this guy's quoting it too, is that he's, he's quoting people from his tradition and authority from his tradition saying the same things that he believes. Yeah. He's the creator of all things except he's not responsible for evil. How can he be creator of all things and not responsible for evil? He says he's not. I believe him. He says he's good. I believe him. He says grace is his work in my heart. I believe him. He says he will seek and save and keep all of his sheep. I believe him. I love my kids. For somebody to say that the the uh, reform position, the position of actual grace is taking your child and putting it on the pier, as long as I'm saved, I love you, it's fine. How that is so blasphemous. And it actually is the opposite of what has happened. Jesus was the one that went on that funeral pier or that cross in the place of people that believe. And no Christian, no reform person is following Calvin. So please, please don't even bother commenting on that. We're following the Bible and various people throughout history have held that position, including Jesus himself. We're following the teaching of God's grace, not a man that you disagree with. But in this video, they're saying, well, I I'm physically being accused of taking my children, putting them on a thing and say, take them. I'm fine. It's fine. It's just take them instead of me. That is not at all what's happening. It's Jesus that went there instead of me. It's Jesus. Yeah. That, I think this is proving that he's not following Warren's comments. Uh, he's not following the intention of the comment, nor is he following the actual words that were actually stated in context. He's, he's taking Warren's statement to mean that Calvinists are in a sense giving up their own children um as as uh as, you know as a means of their own salvation like hey i'm going to surrender my child for the sake of my own election for the sake of my own salvation and that's not what warren was saying obviously we were both calvinists we both we, none of us were believing that we're giving up our own kids for our salvation like we're meriting our salvation by giving up our kid nobody's saying that and that's, and that's what he seems to be arguing against, proving that he so far missed the point of, of Warren's statement that, you know, I don't, I'm not even sure it's worthy of, of discussion because, again, he's following White here because White seems to be taking Warren the exact same way, is that basically what, what Warren was saying was that Calvinists are all willingly sacrificing their children for their own salvation. And obviously that's not what's going on. Do you want to comment on that? 
Yeah, I cut the tail end of it. No, I wasn't saying it was transactional where like, I'll give you one of my babies if you give me eternal life or yeah. you can have three of my children if I get uh, eternal life and the Maserati. That wasn't, I wasn't saying that was Calvinist. I was drawing a, a I don't know, maybe you might even call it a hasty generalization. I mean, like uh, there, were, there were ways that they could have pushed back on that uh, yeah. other than to call me a blasphemer and take my comments out of, out of context. But but yeah, no, that well, was not even in the media and even the immediate response video, you even said, you know, I could have worded it more carefully or it could have been more clear uh, in, in my, in my way of wording it. Um, but at the same time, once you hear someone out and you go, Oh, okay. I see what he's saying. Now he's talking about infant damnation and people being willing to swallow that inconceivable pill and still worship this God and say, I believe God does this, but I'm still willing to worship him in the same way a pagan worshiper de of a false deity is willing to do this heinous, horrible thing, swallow that pill. As long as they get what they need, they're willing to do it and still do whatever they need to do to worship this pagan deity. There, there's a similarity there. There's a common surrendering of the sense making between those two groups. And that's the point we're trying to get to is how far are you willing to go? How, how much are you willing to concede is true about God, whatever that X is that we talked about earlier, that most heinous, how far, where's the line that you're willing to draw to say, oh, no, 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 that's too far. That, 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 that you said about God, that's too far. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't swallow that pill. Okay. So even if somebody else who is very authoritative comes with a particular passage of scripture and they've interpreted it to mean whatever you say that line is, then are you not willing to go over that line then? And that's my point is when do you allow yourself to stop going so far as just to let those people who are interpreting these scriptures for you that you've surrendered your sense making over to where you're willing just to continue to swallow whatever difficult, heinous, inconceivable thing they say about the God you worship that you're willing to finally go, I'm putting my foot down. I, I, I don't believe that. I, I know you think that that's what Lamentations 62, four says whatever verse out there that they obscurely pull out of its context to say, this is, this means God thinks this, this means God believes this, this means God is this way. And they've interpreted it, whatever verse it is in whatever way it is, when is it that you'll finally put your foot down and go, that's not good. That's wrong. That's evil. That's not God. And that's what I'm, I'm asking you just to consider is when will you allow your sense-making, the God-given conscience that he's given you, finally engage to go, I'm not willing to go there. Or at least tread lightly, for goodness sake. At least at least back off and go, yeah, like some on Twitter are doing, yeah, I'm not willing to go there. I, I see where it's going. I see where my logic kind of, but I'm just not going to go there. I have a little bit more respect. Well, I have a lot more respect for that position than I do the ones that are just willing to dive into the deep yeah. end of infant yeah. damnation, because at least those people, though inconsistent, at least they're going, I'm not going to go where MacArthur is and say universal, you know, infant salvation, but I'm also not going to claim infant damnation. I'm just going to stay out of the fire in between somewhere and go, mm. to be honest, Warren, I know you were saying be hot or be cold, but I, I honestly, I have more respect for people who go, I'm not getting in there. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what, I don't know what I believe about that, but I'm not getting into that fight and I don't know what it, I don't know what I believe about it. I, I honestly have a little bit more respect for that person than the person who's willing to swallow that inconceivable pill of infant damnation because come on. I mean, that's, that's, that's a, that's a hard I, one, but here's, yeah. here's the thing. If you, if you affirm exhaustive divine determinism, then everything that comes to pass was done so by God. So there's nothing that you could literally point to that's saying it's too far for me to worship God because you literally think he is bringing everything to pass. So there is no line for the theistic determinist. Like <laughs> God could reveal himself um, in, a, in a very uh, antithetical way, let's just say, to Christ. But if you believe that's God and that's the divine determinism, then you're going to go, well, I'm going to surrender my sense making and accept that there is, there's no end in that view. So at some point you, you elevate exhausted divine determinism above the text of scripture and the self-revelation, because you can literally dismiss that 
as well, God determined me to believe that for a while, but now I'm on to this other thing because God decreed. So there, there is no, there is, I don't think there's a clear line there. Um, if that's your, your standard, you've, you've got to make the standard, uh, the text of scripture that has, that has to be your standard and, and the revelation of who God is in that, that has to be the standard. So if you're just, if your standard is my precept about exhausted divine determinism or this, this, uh, council or this confession or this creed, um, and you're, you're holding to that. I, I don't know where there is a point of no return. I don't, I don't see like you can just keep going. You, you, there, you, you know, it doesn't seem like there's a, an issue there. So I, I would just encourage anyone that's on the fence about this to set aside their metaphysics, their, uh, their, their, their confessions, their creeds, and just open up the Bible and with fear and trembling and in great prayer, go before the Lord and go, please show me who you are. Like mm-hmm. I, I need to know who you are. Is this the kind of God you are? You know, I'll I'll follow you. You're the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah. But I'm not scared anymore. I'm going to trust you. You know, if you're a well, if you're a baby dammer, then so be it. But if you're a good and loving God who desires that no one should perish, and you've said that you know children are the standard for admittance into the kingdom of heaven, and this leads me to believe that, then I'm going to go that way. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to bring up these uh, these quotes that I had from. Uh, yeah, let me do this a uh, couple of st- stars while you're pulling that in. Um, uh, thank you, Vernum Argumentum. Um, wh- what do I say to a Calvinist who says he doesn't have to accept infant condemnation to be a Calvinist? Um, well, again, most Calvinists, at least the m- most notable Calvinists, don't believe in infant condemnation yeah. or in- infant damnation, like MacArthur and and uh, Piper and others. I-, I don't think their arguments are very consistent for reasons that we have laid out. But at the same time, um, you know, God bless their inconsistency. I mean, I, I it's one of those things that um, that you, you can call them out on their inconsistency. It's the same thing I do with John John MacArthur's book on love, because he he debates with A. W. Pink and says, you know, because Pink says God hates you know some people hates the reprobate, um, but but MacArthur argues against that and makes a really strong biblical argument for why. Christ, in order to be the fulfillment of the law, had to be one who loved his, all of his enemies. And so he, he genuinely loves all of his enemies. Now, he so redefines love to mean something that's totally, completely antithetical to what love actually is defined as in the scripture, that I think MacArthur is very inconsistent in his views. I think Pink is more consistent with his Calvinism, whereas MacArthur is more consistent with the Bible um, than he is with Calvinism. And the same thing is true of this. I think MacArthur's not consistent with Calvinism by holding to infant salvation, but he is more consistent with the Bible. And so I, I would rather a Calvinist be more consistent with the Bible. Uh, it's, it's what, it's what uh, Spurgeon argued when he said, who am I to be internally consistent? If, if, and he comes to 1 Timothy 2, 4 about God desiring all to be saved. He says, I know how the old Calvinists have done away with this text, but... I'm not going to be inconsistent with the word of God. It obviously reads that he desires all men to be saved. And I'm not going to let my Calvinism cause me to be inconsistent with what the word of God says is basically his argument, but in a, a paraphrasing. And, and so I thank God for inconsistent Calvinists. It's one of the reasons that I don't cast them out of the kingdom because the most high extreme Calvinism, you know what it looks like? Go look at Westboro Baptist. That's the extreme consistent Calvinists. And, and that, that's the fruit of that view lived out perfectly consistently. Um, and, 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 and so thank God that, that Calvinists are not, not consistent. Anthony, thank you for your super chat. What about the argument that your view makes abortion merciful? I do not believe that non, not a Calvinist. I'm debating turret fan. Okay. On February. Okay. So I think what you're asking is saying, Okay, Should we send for the grace may abound? Like, that's that's the that's the real argument here. Is it's like you're saying, Leighton, that God doesn't send babies to hell. Well, then why don't you just kill your baby? Well, if you if you think my criticism was that all Calvinists are cool with child sacrifice, that's probably not the best line of argumentation you want to levy in response. You know, you think I kill? I'm in favor of child sacrifice. Well, then you should just kill your baby. That's that's not. For optics' sake, please, if you're a Calvinist, don't don't use that argument. Like, 
you're going to give people that, that really want to run with your faulty interpretation of my statements a lot more fuel than you want to. But no, we don't, we don't recommend <laughs> sinning so that grace may abound. We're not saying, well, you get automatic in, in, uh, entrance into the kingdom of heaven, so just kill your babies, right? The Christian says, uh, we want the parents to know the Lord. We want the parents to have a right relationship with God. We want the parents to raise their children in the way that they'll go. We want the children to have a right relationship with God. The way that we accomplish this is not through more heinous sin. <laughs> that, 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 that's a, that, it's a, pardon pardon the, the criticism here, but that it's, it's an asinine rebuttal to say, well, if you think that uh, babies are sinless, then you should go and sin. No, no, you're, you're missing, you're missing the whole, the whole boat. The ship has sailed. Like, that's that's not that's not the uh, the case here. Love the Lord. Show your children the love of the Lord. Teach them with fear and admonition. Show them not just the Bible memorization, but the heart of the Father. Show them a God who is so loving that they can't help but cry out like the angels in heaven. Like yeah. God is good, and when we see Him for who He is, we're going to love that. Uh, so raise your children the way they go. And this is this will feed into my comment in a minute uh, with the quote. But 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 no, don't you don't go and slay your children just so that they, and I know he wasn't saying that was his view, but he's, 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 he's heard that object. I've heard that objection, you know, yeah. well, if you're, if you're, well, let me, let me lead into your, your quote. So why don't you go ahead and go there with that? Yeah. You want to open that up that window? Oh yeah. I'm sorry. So, um, I'm going to see if I can zoom in here. Uh, yeah. So, um, you can see the the blue here that I highlighted. So uh, this is this is actually from um, a gentleman by the name of, well, dang it, uh, here we go, uh, Epiphanius the the Latin or the Scholacticus, I believe is what he was called. Um, but he says here, four hundred three. He was born in four hundred three A.D. So early, early yes. um, writer, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there you go. So you can see oh, it's uh, Ep yeah. Epiphanius the Scholacticus. Did I? There we go. Um, but you can see here he says. Um, Speaking of children, for they are ignorant of wickedness. They do not know how to return evil for evil or how to do someone an injury. They do not know how to be lustful or how to fornicate or how to rob. What they hear, they believe. They love their parents with complete affection. Therefore, beloved, the Lord instructs us that what they are by the gift of nature, do you see this? What they are by the gift of nature, it's a gift who gave that to them, the Lord. Why? Why is it? Why are they good? Because they're fearfully and wonderfully made. What they have by the gift of nature, we should become by the fear of God, a holy way of life, and love of the heavenly kingdom. For unless we are alien to all sin, just like children, we cannot come to the Savior. And um, you know, I think that's a, a pretty powerful quote there. Yeah, it reminds me of a sermon I heard from Ralph Emerson at the um, uh, the conference that I just came from. The uh, by the way, people who think I, I you never do anything else, I it just came from uh, the statewide evangelism conference that I, I coordinated, and um, Ralph did a really great job, great sermon. Um, he's one of those preacher preachers and really brings it brings it brings it hard, and it, it, it was powerful. And one of the points he talks about is loving loving like a toddler. And, um, I wasn't even thinking about this when, when I heard him preaching it, but it came to mind hearing that quote because he, he started describing how toddlers love. And it's so true. It's like, they don't notice the color of your skin. They don't notice, um, you know, what you're wearing. Um, they don't, they don't hold you, you know, they don't, they don't hold a grudge. Um, they, you know, all the things that you think about the best of the best of people, you see in the, in the littlest of these, um, the, the innocence of, the, of a child. And that's not to say that children can't do bad things and, and be disruptive and all kinds of things that we see within kids at times. But generally speaking, I, I know when, when my kids were all that toddler age, that little bitty age though they had their moments, usually when they were tired or they were, you know, dirty, they, they are need to be cleaned or had some, you know, obviously physical need that would, they would cry out, in, in those kinds of things because they didn't know how else to communicate. But for the most part, there's this, this just unconditional love that they have for the ones who care for them and, 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 and willingness to smile and giggle and, and coo at whoever comes to talk to them. And I mean, there's just, 
It's by nature. And we all know this as parents. We see this with our kids um, and the innocence of a child um, and, and the, the theology which has the whole viper and diaper kinds of mentality, worse than rats kind of mentality, I think undermines the Imago Dei and the creation in which God's created it, us in his image and the goodness that he has created us. Um, and I don't think that that can be overlooked. Now, I understand because the world in its, you know, the liberal left and on all the indications of all, oh, we're all just everybody, everybody's a good person. And we're all, um, we're all perfect and everybody's good just the way you are. And, and I know and sometimes that's the pendulum swing is that we're trying to swing away from that everyone's hunky dory, you know, everybody's fine. Nobody has any problems whatsoever. No sin. There's nothing, no such thing as sin. No, no thing as God's wrath. No such thing as any of those things. That, that extreme and extremely, you know, that pendulum swing all the way back over here. Oh, we've got to, we've got to hyper emphasize the, the wormless of man. And that's where I think the pendulum has gone too far the opposite direction to, to fail to recognize the, Imago Day that God created us in his image and that there is good because God created us. Um, not good in and of ourselves because everything we have in and of ourselves is of God. God created us. He's the one who made us. And so when you, when you start to just hammer on mankind as being this horrible, heinous, evil thing, you, you don't recognize you're hammering on God's creation. God created us. Um, and so you can't, you've got to separate the created being from the impact that sin has had on that created being and, and recognize that an infant and a young child hasn't had as much influence of that sin as an adult who's been around the sin and has been corrupted and has all kinds of, uh, of other things influencing his mind and his heart than does a, a, a toddler, for example. Um, there was one other starter, Bill, Bill uh, or Ben, excuse me, is making a point. And I've heard this, I've heard this argument before. It says, if, if Adam's original sin, death, is abolished from 2 Timothy 1.10, 1 Corinthians 5, 15, 26, prior to the great white throne judgment, don't all babies come resurrected alive and unencumbered by original sin to the great white throne judgment? Um, and I think what he's arguing um, is, is a particular maybe it's eschatological kind of perspective of the, uh, of the judgment. In other words, people are because of Christ's work are not automatically considered sinful because of what Christ did. I think Wesley held to more of a view that way that we don't have the innate corruption, i.e. the T of total inability because of what Christ did on the cross. And so basically, for all practical purposes, Wesleyan Arminians are like a provisionist. They just add in this concept and idea that because of what Christ did, he removed that inability. Now, I'm not saying that's what Ben's talking about, but but he's basically saying that that uh, original sin guilt is not automatically imputed because Christ took it upon himself. Is that the way you're understanding that, Warren? Yeah, and, and I I think this is another case of the um, the uh, the aardvark and the um, what was it that we did a, a while back. I think you're Pink elephant you're, aardvark. You're, yeah, yeah. You're, you're basically trying to create a solution to a problem that doesn't exist because now the work of Christ is retroactively applied to those removing original sin. It's it's like I think I think if you just get rid of the Augustinian presupposition of that anthropology, I think it's a little less clunky. But I think you're right on that. I think that. He's arguing that they come to the uh, the judgment without that guilt or that stain, so they're 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 pretty much automatically saved as a result of that. So it's another way of getting there, but it certainly is not affirming infant damnation. Now there, there may be an argument that that may not necessarily work retroactively to infants who perished prior to Christ. There's some maybe some arguments there. I don't really care to explore um, as long as he's not you know 
one of the baby chuckers. Yeah, there. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the thing is there's a there's probably a dozen different ways to get to the same conclusions, and that's that's you know how you deal with these kinds of things theologically is like okay, how does this work, or what's what's going behind behind the scenes here. And sometimes you're trying to, like you said, you're trying to solve a problem that didn't exist. Yeah. Um, and so if you don't, if you don't ad- adopt the Augustinian grid of original sin, total inability from that, from that uh, uh, full Augustinian perspective of uh, determinism, then you don't, you don't have this issue. Um, and even among those who are even within the reformed tradition and do adopt a form of original sin, like Zwingli or Mer- Millard Erickson and, and the like, they still don't have to adopt that Augustinian concept um, and, and they can still be considered in that realm of theological ways of uh, interpreting this text in the grid of the Augustinian grid to a degree, but not to the fullest degree. That's why it's so frustrating when you hear white and others talk as if I don't believe in original sin. Oh, so Zwingli didn't believe in original sin. Uh, did Miller, Miller Erickson doesn't believe in original sin. Both of those guys are Calvinists. Yeah. Um, no, they believe in a different view of original sin than you do. Um, so you, you get, you get a lot of that kind of, th- those kinds of arguments. Um, well, Derek, either way Derek you go. Beeler's comment, he said, uh, I take a flawed method to get to the good conclusion when the top, when the topic is infant damnation. Amen. I mean, I agree with you on that hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, uh, very, very good way of looking at it. Um, yeah. And then, and Ben follows up says the, the Calvinist argument is that original sin stains the infants and babies. I think Augustine's view of original sin is moot because uh, Adam's judgment is vacated anyway. Uh, and so he's I can kind of from a different, from a different vantage point there. Um, yeah. T, t uh, Heidenberger says, if God knows everything, including reprobates, would you condemn God for damning baby Hitler? Oh, that James White argument. Uh, yeah. Uh, he's got a response to um, Bob Inyart where he says, how do you know the baby he's damning to fire is not the next baby Hitler? Oh, I remember that. And you're like, okay, that that's a strong argument there. Uh, we're going, we're going to send babies to hell, not because they're guilty, but because they, they will eventually be guilty. And the reason they'll eventually be guilty is because it's I because determined them to be. Yes. Because I'm the one who decrees all things that come to pass, including the things that Hitler ends up doing. So God is so, damning infants to hell because they did not yet act on the decree he ineffectually was going to make them act upon. <laughs> it, it is that it's that the same argument as so the it's a restraining quickly. evil argument. It's like when he talks about how uh, you know think about all of the things that had to happen for Christ to come. I mean, even when Joseph and Mary, he talks about them going to Bethlehem. There, there could have been a robber on the road, and if they have libertarian freedom, they can go out there and possibly kill Joseph and, and kill the uh, Mary, and Jesus would never have been born then. See, there's all this kinds of stuff, but no, no, God's restraining evil. Okay, so God decrees this supposed robber to desire to rob on the road to Damascus or on the road to Bethlehem, and it puts him there and decrees him to do this, and then steps in and restrains him from doing what he decreed for him to do. How does that make any rational sense? It doesn't fit determinism at all. It doesn't. It's, there's no. There's nothing to restrain if there's not libertarian free will. So it's just. It's just. Now, I, I they did, make our case for us. I did promise one of the, the commenters that I was going to quote some Chrysostom. I'm a I'm a huge Chrysostom for, fan, it. and it wouldn't. It, I I don't feel right if I don't mention him at least once in every broadcast I'm a part of. But he said, well, while, while you're doing that, I'm going to take a take a, a break real quick. It's a so, one sentence okay. quote. I'm sorry, I don't have a long one for you. Well, I can play a commercial if you want me to, but yeah, I'm you want to take, take a break, a break we'll eventually. We'll take a break. Everybody, go get some popcorn, uh, concessions, <laughs> tip your wait staff. <laughs> You're hilarious. Tip your wait staff. All right, we'll we'll be right back. Are you looking for a solid theological education? Professor Layton Flowers is now teaching online courses for Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary. With over 45 years of established, respected, and proven excellence in academic ministry training, Trinity has provided education for hundreds of ministers now serving around the globe. 
get your degree online at Trinity or audit any one of the many courses offered to improve your ministry skills. Trinity is flexible to meet the demands of any minister. Get a quality education on your schedule at an affordable price. Discounts are offered for podcast listeners. Use the promo code FLOWERS when you enroll online. For more details, go to Soteriology101.com and click on the classroom link at the top of the page. We invite you to join Professor Flowers in fulfilling the legacy of Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary. Hey, and I made Jonathan Pritchett happy, so can't do any better than that, right? You need a you need a dancing popcorn and like you need you need the old uh, concession commercial. That's what you need in there too. Give you more time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, we'll go ahead and yeah, go ahead and bring up the quote now. Yeah, I was just I was just going to read it because I just I typed it up real quick. But he says he says this is John Chrysostom. He says quote, and he's speaking on the same issue uh, that we had mentioned earlier, um, that where Jesus was saying, "Forbid not the children to come to me." John John Chrysostom said, "Quote, therefore he said." of such is the kingdom of heaven, that by choice we should practice these things which young children have by nature, end quote. So again, we by choice, right, should practice these things which young children have by nature. John Chrysostom, provisionist. Which really, which really goes right along with uh, the kingdom of heaven is made up of such as these. And, and Jesus bringing up a random child out of the audience and saying, you must become like this. You must be, you must humble yourself like this child to enter the kingdom of heaven. That makes so much more sense uh, from that worldview than from the viper and diaper type of perspective that, that, that the Calvinist typically defends. Uh, and again, I say typically because I know some very inconsistent Calvinists who don't take uh, that, that approach. So, well, I've got uh, I've got a, a comment from a consistent Calvinist. If you want me to read it, where uh, he's telling us his view of babies. That's on the yeah. screen. If you want to pull that up. Oh yeah, yeah. So this is a a, a gentleman. He says um, I don't know if you guys can see it. You may want to um, enlarge it. But he says babies come out of the womb immediately complaining to God of their surroundings, screaming in contempt, fear, and lack of faith. They soon begin coveting after everything in sight and will display extreme hubris, uh, outbursts of wrath when they don't get what they want. Uh, they do not honor their father and their mother and must be taught how to. When they learn to speak and use logic, they immediately use those skills to lie and deceive their parents concerning their wrongdoings. They willfully disobey every parental command, and they believe they can get away with even, uh, even when experience shows them they can't. Brothers will fight the moment they are able to swing a limb. They easily believe fantastic lies like Santa Claus because they love lies. <laughs> so now, okay, who, who, who <laughs> lied to them? They, they were deceived because they're babies. Oh gosh. They were tricked because they're innocent. They're, literally, we read oh. quotes about how they're so trusting and we need to be like them and they trust their parents. And he goes, look at them trusting their lying parents about Santa. That proves they're totally depraved. It's like, Bro. I've heard I've heard a lot of really foolish uh, arguments, but that that's that takes the cake. Oh my gosh, um, <laughs> believing in Santa proves his total inability. There you go. Yeah, I mean it's, <laughs> it's all right. Not, here's not here's fatal fatal heart. Thanks for the super chat. The gospel was preached to the dead. All people are going to be judged through Christ. Why necessitate infant innocence and another way to the father? I don't know. I don't know that anybody is saying there's another way to the father. I think the only way to the father is through Christ. Yep. And so I don't know why an infant being guilty would create another way to the father. I think what they're trying to say is, is if you don't believe in infant damnation, then you must believe that there's another way to be saved except through Christ. You think doesn't that's what follow. they're trying to say? Non sequitur. It doesn't doesn't follow. Yeah, we, we already, already answered said, that earlier. Yeah, we've already um, said maybe how if we you, need Jesus. Even the, even the innocent babies who haven't committed a sin need Jesus to save them from mortality and sustain them and resurrect them and teach them and show them love and all of the things that that we need. Uh, it doesn't stand that that they would somehow 
kick the, <laughs> these, these infants are kicking the doors, the gates to the king, like Peter's up there, you know, in those old cartoons, he's like, what's going on with all these babies overrunning heaven? God's like, I can't do anything. They're innocent. You know, Oh, they got here without me. It, I don't, I don't think that's, I don't think that's the argument we're making. Yeah. Well, and do you use the old argument? I think, uh, I don't know if it's if it original with me or with, uh, no, I know it's not original with me. Uh, the, the crack baby, uh, analogy, which is, I know, kind of a crass thing talk about crack babies, but my mom used to work for, uh, you know, in the, uh, the maternity ward and uh, there would be, you know, often prostitutes that would get be addicted to crack cocaine and they would have babies who were born addicted to crack cocaine. They're born under the uh, with a curse. They're born with a, a, a an illness, not because of their own fault, their own wrongdoing, but because of the wrongdoing of their mother. Um, and, and that's used as an illustration of being born under the curse of sin. Um, now you could say, well, because the baby's born with the curse of being addicted to crack cocaine, um, therefore, uh, it's not, it's not the baby's fault. They're not guilty. Therefore you don't, they don't need to be treated for their disease. Well, no, that doesn't follow. You, You don't, you still have to treat the child. You still have to they still need treatment. They still need help. Yeah. And so you're, you, you, you're not saying that there's no consequence for the, uh, the guilt of Adam and, and for the fall of man and being cast out of the garden, there's, there's still a problem to deal with. You don't have to have guilt to admit there's a problem to be dealt with is the point. And so I, I don't know if that illustration helps, but it's no, just, it does, it's especially when you things. pair it with, with like Ezekiel 18, where like, let's say the mother was the one who was guilty for ingesting drugs while pregnant, the sin of the the parent will remain on the parent and the, the innocence or the righteousness will remain on the innocent and the righteous. So the baby can be born suffering the negative consequences for the sin of the parent, but the guilt remains on the parent. The scriptures right. re- repeatedly over and over all throughout scripture. It affirms this, um, you know, and, and, and one of the things real quickly, there, there are some comments that kind of get into atonement theories. I'm not going to do that here. The, the early church is abundant with models on the work of Christ. And so to insist that total depravity and infant damnation must follow because I affirm a particular atonement theory, you're begging the question. You're begging the question for your anthropology and you're begging your question for your interpretation of your pet atonement theory. There's so many different ways that that can be hashed out. Um, so you know, just rethink, rethink the whole enchilada and, and go back to the text, look at the early scripture or, or early church and the way they understood scripture. And I think you're, you're going to get there. Yeah. Uh, one more super chat here and we're going to bring things to a close pretty quick. So if we you have any questions, four hours, Leighton. Oh. <laughs> no. people might, might actually wait. watch this one. I don't. <laughs> Since Paul Washer once said that if a baby had the strength of an adult, he would kill the parents for not giving what the baby wants. Yeah. Um, well, and, and you may, you may argue something like that to be true on the basis that, you know, just like a, a, uh, you know, a, a gorilla, you know, because of their cognitive, because of their cognitive inabilities, they're an animal might kill a human being in order to get what they want because they're just a big old strong, dumb human being or, you know, dumb animal. And you might say, well, an infant, if it was given the strength of a, a gorilla, might hurt the people around him because his cognitive abilities doesn't match up with the arm strength. Well, yeah, but it's not because the baby has this natural hatred and animosity towards the person who's feeding them. I mean, it's just that kind of stuff gets gets really absurd. Um, I, I don't know even how to respond to stuff no, like that sometimes. Um, Romans 3.23 equals Calvinism plus verse 24 equals universalism plus 25 equals provisionism. <laughs> Look, I'm a public well, school makes, student. Like, don't, don't make me do math on, on like a live stream. I, I'm going to break uh, out the Pythagorean theorem. I'm going to make an embarrassment of all of us. Uh, uh, a squared plus B squared equals uh, C squared. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I was trying to pull up uh, Romans three just to see what he's what he's trying to get to. Um, Romans three twenty three. Uh, well, well, let's do this. We'll put this up on the screen. Okay, wait. Oh man, I did it wrong. Share screen. Okay, wait. 
There it is. Okay, so he's saying verse 23 is Calvinism for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I, I, I wouldn't agree with that because we all believe all sin is fall short of the glory of God. That wouldn't equal Calvinism as far as I'm concerned. It would equal things that are, maybe what they're saying is, is uh, Calvinism and all of us would ag agree that everyone has sinned and fall short of God, God's glory. Okay, so verse 24, um, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. So I guess that means everybody is saved. Everybody is saved universalism. Because we're then, still following from the same all in verse 23. So oh, that would, okay. That so, would then yeah. make it universalism. Gotcha. And then whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith, which was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance, God, he passed over the sins previously committed. Um, yeah. And that would be provisionism because the provision of Christ's blood uh, and it's through faith that it's applied, not universally applied. So yeah, I get what he's I get what he's yeah. saying. Yeah, okay. Yeah, makes sense. Making us do the math, Patmos. Yeah, oh, I had man. to do work. Make me do work. <laughs> and at the end of the live stream, when all of our brain cells are fried, yeah, not at the beginning no, when we're fresh, much, that's a low much, blow, dude. Much. That's a low blow. <laughs> yeah, some some people were following. He says he get he gets what he's saying. Okay. Yeah. Well, I I I am reaching my 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 threshold. I'm getting old and can't can't go the, the long four hour ones anymore but um i think we covered this one pretty well we we got we, we at least got out there those that are tr still trying to say that james white doesn't believe in infant damnation at least they're able to see that uh for you know in his own words what he actually said about it and so I, I wanted to make sure that people realize why this is an important issue why we should not be uh willing to uh just swallow the inconceivable pill of infant damnation, regardless of how much we respect the person who's promoting it. Um, and no, no matter how many uh, confessional statements he quotes as support for it, it's still an inconceivable pill that shouldn't be swallowed no matter where you, where you come from. But with that said, go now, share Christ, show love. God bless.